Okay. Oh, and Alex on already.
Okay. Well, good morning, Southeast Conference. You know, it's our tradition on the last morning of the day to uh, to kind of have a a slower start. Uh, at least we're moving slower as we start. But <laughs> I don't know if uh, if anyone else went out to the virtual event uh, with me and these folks from my background uh, last night. But as always, um, I, we we really miss having everyone in proximity to each other and. Uh, uh, but it's been a good week. Um, Alec, good morning. Yeah, good morning. Yeah, this probably is the most rested I've been on the last day. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, um, <laughs> there's good and bad things about that. <laughs> it, it, indeed there is. But, you know, um, everyone really, I think, enjoyed, those that were able to stick around for the Transportation Committee yesterday, really enjoyed the opportunity to uh, get on screen together and uh, see each other and and get engaged and um, that's uh, that's what will actually will happen today at the membership meeting as well so uh, folks can make sure they comb their hair guys get your mascara out or whatever it does to make you look good um, and uh, for the membership meeting at at 11 uh, following the admiral's remarks we will be elevating everyone up to panelist status um, and so everyone will have a chance to to, um, to see each other and, and be engaged and offer um, comments as well. Um, Alec, tell folks about the, the, the auction uh, activities yesterday. Yeah, well, I, I just pulled it up again, actually, and there's, there's a few more items that were added. Um, uh, it must have been fairly late yesterday that those were added because I didn't <laughs> see them when I was browsing earlier and, uh, and apparently holding on to high bid for more items than I probably should. So uh, definitely hope there's more people who are going to check that out today and, uh, and you know, see if there's anything there that you're interested in and remembering that this is going to fund the UAS scholarship fund. So really appreciate uh, people participating in that, uh, in that auction. Well, what about uh, Casey and uh, the transportation committee yesterday that raised the paddle? And that turned out really well. So what did that, that wound up being uh, close to $5,000 raised during, during that session. Uh, so $4,700. That's fantastic. So thanks everybody for, for your donations. And uh, um, yeah, it's really, it's a really meaningful contribution. Yeah, well, you know, and speaking of meaningful com contributions, I really wanted to um, go through the list of sponsors from this year because you know, we didn't do, you know, a hard sell on any sponsorships. Uh, it's a tough year for um, just the entire region and everybody, but there was a number of folks that um, stepped up. And we really want to recognize them and express our appreciation. Uh, you know, we've, we've got our, our, our top tier of, of, um, of sponsors, uh, Clink and Hyatt Central Council, uh, Avista AELMP, um, Alaska Marine Lines, and the... Um, um, okay, I don't have these in alphabetical order. Yeah, did I, did I get our, oh yeah, that's our core. That's our, that's our top top four, and then we've got um, other event sponsors. Um, we had Cruise Line International Association, Alaska Seaplanes, the Landing Hotel, McDowell Group, uh, ASME, you know the Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute, Search, First Bank, Peace Health. The Alaska Committee and Tyler Rent Rental. So, uh, really, there we go. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and what <laughs> this looks so smooth and and effortless. This entire week has gone off really without any hitches at all. But um, that's really due primarily to Sarah and Jessica working uh, long, long hours, uh, getting ready for this, getting everything set up, and then making this happen. As well as uh, Karen Peterson down there in, uh, in Prince of Wales. We've had help from, from Nathan and um, our friends at, at Spruce Root as well. So it, it certainly takes it takes a team to get this thing uh, put together and executed. But we really uh, thank, thank you to all the, all the sponsors that, uh, that we've, we've had for this event. Yeah, so, thank you very much. Um, I don't know, um, Alec, if you want to um, do a highlight, let everybody know what we're looking forward to today as far as agendas or um, I think. Yeah, sure. Uh, so this morning, uh, I'm pretty excited that we have a, we have a panel of our uh, state elected officials 
Uh, I think it's a, it's always great to hear from them and, and see what things they're going to be focusing on and then provide some feedback for things that the membership is interested in and which they, they keep pretty close tabs on already. So I'm sure they're, they're prepared. Um, we've got uh, a special announcement with uh, Senator Murkowski. So she's going to be coming on a little bit later this morning. Uh, I am excited to hear from uh, from UAS. Uh, you know, clearly there's been a, a lot going on there. So it's uh, It'll be good and some to new, new faces too. It'll be the first yeah, time we've yeah. seen um, uh, the uh, provost uh, has been uh, um, elevated to interim chancellor, and she's just been a, a really strong supporter for our students, our region, and Southeast Conference too. It's been a great partnership there. And um, President Pitney, who's also an interim role, uh, we've had a, a lot of interactions with her over the over the years uh, in her past past uh, couple of employment. Uh, uh, capacity, so it's really good to to see the new team there, and looking forward to hearing from them. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then, so yesterday, we uh, Admiral Barrett wasn't able to make it during the transportation section, so he's going to be uh, presenting at eleven this morning too. And then we roll into the membership. So a lot going on today, and that auction will stay open until eight p.m. So that's our that's our uh, our you know kind of the, the last thing that'll happen here is, is uh, finishing that well and it's um it, it's nice to see those bids still coming in um although we kind of missed the element you don't really get to see who you're competing with uh, so it may be just alec uh <laughs> that's bidding <laughs> up on on these things but no there's there's a lot of bids uh, go, going in and we really appreciate the support that um, everyone has done both in contributing those items and, uh, and, and bidding so that we can uh, have a meaningful auction. So we've just crossed the $10,000 threshold, which for our first virtual events, um, I think is a very, very good, that was kind of our, our, our threshold we really want to, to meet this year and we've got that. So um, keep, keep bidding and see how close we can get to last year's, uh, I think it was $16,000. So uh, thanks everyone. Okay, so, um, we're just a, a couple minutes early, but I see we do have uh, some of our legislators on, so we can we can start uh, moving toward that. Uh, uh, unless there's anything else, Mr. President, that you want to. Um... No, I think uh, you know if we have uh, let, yeah if we have folks who are ready to come on, we can go ahead and get started a little bit early. It's nothing wrong with getting ahead of the schedule sometimes. Well, we um, we we always um, enjoy engaging our elected officials. The number of hours they put into meetings, um, uh, I don't, I don't know. If there's any such thing as as interim anymore. Um, maybe you don't meet formally in in <laughs> session, but uh, it seems that there's no lack of of meetings that you've attended and and been involved with. And um, we'll wait to get the. Uh, uh, we've got, I think, at least two others that confirmed, but. Um, I think we've got, okay, so we've got videos on and I'm trying to see who all, okay. Okay, let's make sure we've got everyone. Okay. Work on a technical issue here. Yesterday, I, uh, you know, we had the Mariculture, or we had the, uh, yeah, we had the Mariculture panel yesterday, and and so I had to change my background to the oysters, but. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so um, Senator Keel is on, but he's waiting. We're waiting to get him tucked tucked in there, and I'm trying to work on my screen view so I can actually see each of you that are that are there. So, um, again, good morning. And as soon as we here we go, we've got the senator on. So we've got uh, we've got our core four, and hopefully we'll get uh, the last two. Um, Representative Christ Tompkins did confirm, and um, so we'll hopefully. Just pick Marcos. Okay. Just Marcos. No, no. And then three those up. Okay. And then hide. Okay. okay. Now, thank you. Like I said, did I mention it takes a village to uh, to pull these things together? I'm, I'm the, 
<laughs> one of the most needs sometimes. Anyway, good morning to each of you. Thanks for joining us. And um, we want to kind of just start off by, um, you know, giving each of you just a few minutes to uh, just talk about where you're at, um, anything that's on your mind before we get into more structured questions. Uh, just to remind folks that are online that um, while we want you to use the chat box to engage each other um, throughout uh, the day, the Q&A box is the only thing that I'm seeing uh, for, for questions. So uh, tap in whatever questions you have for our elected leaders here and we will make sure we get that, um, that asked to them. So um, Senator, you wanna start uh, off there and then we'll uh, uh, go, go around and just whatever's on your mind. And since we've got a couple minutes early, Instead of the three minute mark, you can take a whole four minutes if you each of you, you want to for early participation. Good morning. Oh, that's, that's perfect, Robert. Four minutes is what it takes for me to put somebody in a coma. Three, they all still be awake. None of you have had that much caffeine. Well, good morning. Uh, and thanks everyone for having us on here. Uh, uh, have been enjoying the conference so far. Would enjoy it a heck of a lot more if it was in Haynes instead of in my office. Um, but we do the best we can. Um, Thanks everyone for, for being here this morning uh, and uh, definitely get some more coffee because it's a long time until Dan and Andy who are interesting. You got to go through me first. Um, I'm Jesse Keel, of course, and uh, I know just about everybody on. Um, it's my uh, privilege and pleasure to represent uh, the northern half of Southeast by population in the state Senate. Um, and I just actually want to start not on business, but by saying happy, happy Friday, happy bow tie Friday. Um, and I, I noticed yesterday Robert complained that he didn't have a, bow, a tie uh, for every day of the conference. So here's the thing. I, I don't actually need the rest of the stuff on the auction, um, but everybody who sends Robert a tie to the Southeast Conference office, I'll chip in 50 bucks to the scholarship. Now, if all 77 people on here uh, do it, it's going to be a five-year commitment, but I'll still do it. So if you mail Robert Venables a tie, I'm, I'm good for 50 bucks uh, for, the, for the scholarship fund. So let's talk business. Um, I wanna talk about uh, uh, a couple of things. I know my colleagues are gonna talk a lot about uh, the revenue picture. I certainly talked a fair amount yesterday about the, um, about the ferry system, and I'm sure we'll talk more about that. A Little bit of a sleeper issue that's coming up. Uh, I really think we need the legislature to come back in a special session. Um, and, and nobody likes them, uh, very few people want them. But here's the thing, the pandemic emergency for legal purposes is over on November 15th, unless we get together and do something. Um, and, and the virus isn't over, right? So uh, great panels, especially yesterday, the tourism panel talking about how critical it is that we do this safely as we reopen our economy. Um, we, we've got to do safety first, and when you think about this legal state of emergency, we, we all think about the things we need to do as individuals. And individual responsibility is just critically important. You gotta wear the mask in public, you gotta stay six feet or more apart from people, take it outdoors if you possibly can. There's legal stuff, right? There are pandemic emergency powers that we have given the executive branch that are gonna stop on November 15th if we don't get together and do something. So having the Pioneers Home in Sitka closed to the public, guess what? That wouldn't otherwise be legal. That's a pandemic emergency power, right? Um, some of the uh, some of the medical orders stuff, some of the uh, ability to move medical equipment and and experts around, uh, or even uh, to move PPE around. The money that lets the state help with that in all of our healthcare facilities, pandemic emergency power. There's going to be a lot of chaos the week after November 15 if we don't get together. Um, so, so what else happens? Um, what else do we do? Well, you know, special sessions are one of these things. They can get a little chaotic. Uh, other issues could be on tap, especially if the legislature has to call ourselves in to do it. Um, so I recommend the governor do it so he can limit the scope. Um, I will say if, if the governor does that, he's going to put his favorite subject on, uh, on the call, right? He's going to say, take all the money it takes out of the earnings reserve account from the permanent fund pay PFDs with vast sums of money. And we'd all love to do that if the money were flowing. But um, we are going to, looking forward to next session, have serious, serious budget challenges. And I know my colleagues are gonna talk about those, but I wanted to cue that up. I, I don't think if we meet in November as we should, we're gonna pass some massive PFD. Um, we are gonna grapple 
in January and February and in through the rest of the session with the issues of the state budget and how we pay for the things Alaskans need. So with that, um, I will turn it over to the next presenter. Thanks again for having us this morning. Thank you. And uh, just in the order that I have my, on my screen, Representative Story, you're, you're next. Thank you. Uh, good to be here. I have really enjoyed the conference the last few days. Just everyone in the Southeast is just uh, working hard uh, to come together and stay strong in our region. And just knowing from the information Milani presented that we have had the biggest hit, um, losing jobs, 17% across our state, and saying uh, our economists are saying possibly more than any other place in the nation. And I know people who are listening right now um, have spent thousands of hours uh, working on getting the uh, assistance to the right to people. And I'm greatly appreciative. I know how many hours you guys have put in. So uh, thank you. Uh, I wanted to, uh, uh, Andy Story, I've uh, lived in Juneau um, over 30 years. I love Alaska deeply, been privileged to serve in the house the last two years, uh, representing the Mendenhall Valley, starting at Sunny Point, airport area out the road and uh, just part of the capital city and uh, very grateful to uh, represent the capital and just all legislators and the governor here. Uh, we're thrilled to be your capital city. Uh, thank you so much for your support. Uh, economy, hands down, the biggest thing we are dealing with I was uh, so pleased to see Commonwealth North come out. They have an excellent video on the situation, the financial situation facing Alaskans. And we need to educate our citizens what is in front of us right now. So this video is just great. It's gonna be up on my web. I'm sure you all got it emailed to you this week. It'll be up on my uh, Facebook page. I'm hoping we can share it everywhere. And then there is an exercise, much as what Governor Walker did with Sustainable Futures about how you can help us, uh, what could be the solutions to our budget plan. So really watch for that because it's us helping our fellow citizens um, figure out coming together. It's gonna be a team effort what kind of sustainable plan we can get across the finish line to provide certainty to our regions and our state. And that's when people invest and we can feel comfortable. I wanted to mention education in my few minutes. Uh, one of my jobs is co-chair of house education. We know how critically important education is. We are training our young people to take our place. Uh, we need to have a strong university system. So, uh, we can graduate people for the skills we need and retool our skills for our workforce jobs. Um, I also think active citizens, uh, K through 12, so important. Um, and as employers, we want our, there's nothing more dear to uh, grandparents, parents, all of us, knowing our kids are getting a good education. So I've been, in, a few superintendents have been in touch with me, really concerned because they're having a drop enrollment with the pandemic. I talked to Commissioner of Education, Michael Johnson, the other day. He has said that some districts are actually seeing an increase in enrollment because they are doing, they have more uh, uh, virtual learning um, programs that families have decided to take and not be in their home districts. His plan is districts are gonna go through the student count period uh, then through statute, he does have the opportunity to have another 20 day count uh, some other time in the year if he decided, but he wants to see what these numbers come in, which districts are hurting, what, what need more revenue to serve the students that they have. Um, and, and then as we know, we're hoping we will stay healthy, be able to open, and some of our schools are able to open and we wanna be able to have the budgets to run all of our programs and in planning for next year. We will, school boards will be starting doing that and municipalities reimbursement, we know that's important. So uh, thank you all again, and I look forward to answering questions in a little bit. 
All right, thank you. And um, we're glad to thank you, uh, Senator Stedman and Representative Christ Tompkins for joining us as well. We started just a, a minute early, um, so we can get a running start on the opening comments. Um, heard from Senator Keel and Representative Story, and we're just going around for our three, four minutes. Um, Representative Ortiz, I have you next on the screen. Okay, thank you, Robert. Uh, good to be here this morning. Uh, good to be a part of Southeast Conference. Um, some important work is being done and some good, great communication is happening. And uh, it uh, goes without saying that there was, just, there was just lots of things that had to come together to make a Southeast Conference this year. And so, I want to offer my thanks for the, all the efforts of you and your staff to, to make this happen. Um, yeah, this, this upcoming session is uh, it's going to be an important one. There's just no question about it. Uh, we need to uh, work diligently uh, to establish a long-term fiscal plan, as Representative Story uh, mentioned. That's the primary uh, objective, I think, for this next session is to uh, see if we can put the state on a good glide path, a good uh, firm footing so that um, business can flourish, so that our schools can flourish, so that our, our seniors can, can afford to stay uh, in Southeast Alaska. Um, these are the things that, um, that are so important um, and yet we, we need to accomplish these things with declining um, revenue uh, and, and it'll be a challenge. There's just no question about it. And um, what we really need to do is to make sure that we're communicating with our constituents, communicating with our, our towns, our city governments, um, and uh, um, making sure that everybody knows that, um, you know, um, we can't have everything. Uh, we can't, we can't, uh, have a sustainable fiscal plan and and have everything else too. Uh, that's just not going to happen. But um, I think it's going to be all about uh, communication, all about uh, diligence and commitment to the main priorities uh, dictated in some cases by our Constitution, Alaska Constitution, um, and uh, set those priorities, stay committed to those priorities, and and just work. Uh, diligently, cooperatively uh, amongst all folks uh, is the goal, I think, here, because that's the only way it's going to get done. Um, and with us in Southeast Alaska, that'll include uh, working diligently to, uh, to establish uh, a reliable, predictable schedule in our marine highway system and the funding for that to make that happen. Um, Representative Story talked about the importance of uh, remaining committed to our communities that we represent in terms of things like school bond debt reimbursement, community revenue sharing. Um, those are things that are so critical for local governments to be able to function and to be able to do what they need to do. Um, so uh, if now is not the time uh, for, our, for the state to step away from those kinds of obligations. So with that said, um, you know, personally, um, I'm going to be trying to resurrect a uh, uh, a mariculture bill that was right at the finish line. It was over on the Senate side. Um, and I think it had a representative stories uh, portion of the bill in that as well. Um, and um, that is important because if we can get that, uh, you know, ball up and running again, um, you know, it, it, it was, had it passed, it would establish the regulatory framework for uh, mariculture projects. Um, and to me, when I'm looking at the long-term future of economic growth in coastal Alaska, it just seems that mariculture and what it has to offer um, is the way that we need to go. I know that my friend Marco Shear is, uh, is on board. Marco, I'm not just saying this for you, okay? I'm not. I'm saying it for uh, all the potential projects that are out there. And um, um, it's just something that I'm really excited about. And I think you know, when you look at all the different factors, the factors that these products, the market for these products are never going to go away, um, that we have in coastal Alaska, lots of opportunities, lots of land, lots of water uh, that can uh, house these kinds of facilities. Um, we just need to get the ball up and running. I mean, to me, that's the biggest hope that we have in terms of real job growth 
um, coming out of, out of private enterprise. And the state's partnership in that is to set up the regulatory framework, make it as, as uh, um, accepting as possible. Um, part of the bill that we were looking at would have um, allowed for more rapid permitting of these projects, things like that. Um, and so, yeah, I'm excited about that individual thing. Um, but overall, it's, it's always going to come back to uh, the state budget and to not just the state budget, but to set up a long-term fiscal plan that, again, uh, can put business on a, on a predictable path. We can have confidence. We can move forward and uh, get the ball rolling again. And I also just quickly like to mention that, um, you know, I think that uh, Senator Keel's comments about perhaps a need for a special session. I think that we all need to take a good long look at that um, because um, there are some things that, that do need our attention. Um, so with that said, that's all I got. That's it. All right. Well, that was a great opening statement. Um, and thank you, especially for the, um, the, the support for Mariculture, which is also a good segue into Representative Hannon, because you noticed my picture yesterday. I think there might be a tie in there. Uh, am I right, Representative? Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, so I'm Sarah Hannon, and I represent some northern southeast communities, um, parts of Juneau, Haines, Skagway, Klekwan, Gustavus. But I got a tie to Prince of Wales, and I happened to get to spend a day out at Seagrove as a uh, helping on a harvest day, which was wet and cold, and everyone there was happy to be there. Um, and Marcos does not uh, promote the fact that he is taking a lot of time and effort to mentor anyone who wants to learn about kelp farming. Because in Alaska, he's further ahead than everybody else in their project development. And he completely understands that that is an industry that there is a room for a lot of successful Alaskan businesses. And so he doesn't view them as competitors, he views them as colleagues. Um, and the other piece is that the number, the day I was there, the number of Prince of Wales residents whose boats were working on the project, they're not full-time employees of Seagrove, but they had work, uh, you know, gill netters working before the gill net season started. Um, dive fishermen who were able to work through the winter doing projects there. And so it is, uh, you know, besides Seagrove directly, the ripple effect into rural communities as mariculture comes online is, a, is something that will really be able to impact um, diverse coastal Alaska communities that haven't looked at new industries coming in and how does it fit and it it may not be a 365 day a year job for you but there might be a boat operator or uh, you know a processor um, that can can step into a segment of that market and really help it thrive uh, there have been other businesses that I saw this summer. There was a the first brewery on Prince of Wales started operating this spring um, to open a microbrewery. You know, any, any business, everyone knows this, the day you open, you've got years of planning before the day you open and sell your first product. Um, and for the entrepreneurs who started new businesses in 2020 in the midst of a pandemic um, and, and are making it through their season, that bodes well for their long-term future. Here in Juneau, a storefront um, kombucha store opened that had been selling via other venues for about five years. Um, and that business has been able to continue to operate, um, you know, without a million cruise ship passengers coming through the door and still be successful. So we know that the entrepreneurs of our region understand how local economies tie to state economies, tie to the federal economy. Um, and local leaders certainly know the dramatic impacts and intersect between the state finances and local finances. Um, there was a lot of non-sales tax generated in our region, right? It, it's lost, yet your local government budget still depends on it. And the state doesn't have revenue to replace it. Um, most of our communities are going to see a real hurt come October when, um, again, we're going to see a change in the unemployment insurance, which has been bolstered up by federal assistance through the Federal CARES Act. And 
many of our constituents in this region don't haven't really um, understood that when it goes away they may not have a state benefit or their state benefit may be so low that they're not going to be able to pay the rent and all of this comes to an end with the cares act monies and assistance from the feds at the end of the calendar year so we need to see some federal assistance extensions of CARES Act because when it was initially passed in the spring, our hope and prayer had been, we'd be through this both economically and healthcare wise by the end of the calendar year. And now the, the harsh reality is, we know we're a long ways from the finish of, of either of those, the economic impacts or the healthcare impacts. Um, some of our communities, have been able to protect themselves from the devastating effects. And very early on, one of our briefings um, to legislators said something to the effect, if you institute the correct policies, you don't have a high fatality rate, but you're gonna be criticized as local leaders and state leaders because people are gonna say, see, see everybody didn't die. You don't really, your hospitals aren't devastated and overwhelmed. We've done that in our region, in our state. We've kept our health care impacts from the pandemic in very good measures. But we understand that the economics of this are continuing to devastate us. Um, Skagway, you've, you know, a completely lost economic cycle for them. But Skagway has been able to do direct assistance to citizens in need. So there are ways that our local governments are reaching out and taking care of each other that we didn't even fathom. Um, and we're gonna need to all work together because before the pandemic, we had a revenue problem in Alaska and that hasn't gone away. Um, it's gotten worse because the revenues that we should have gotten, fish taxes are down, uh, car rental taxes for the state are down, uh, Airport revenues are down, and we're not predicting that they're all going to be back come next year. So we hope that a rising tide will lift more boats, and we all need to make sure that everybody's got a life preserver handy because we need it. We're in this together. Thanks. Thank you, Representative. You know, <clears throat> one of the great things about Southeast Alaska is we all work together, uh, we interact, and uh, Sometimes we have some really good uh, photos uh, uh, about each other too. So, uh, not to mention, oh, there. <laughs> uh, so uh, yes, there she is. All right. Well, um, we uh, yes, and um, you, we have the rest. The rest of you, we've got we've got photos too. So uh, thank you for that. And you know, it's really exciting to see what opportunities Mariculture uh, does does have for the region and. Um, and while we're uh, slightly off the, the, the topics of things, um, I've been asked what color tie that uh, I want. And the reason why that's, uh, that's up there is because uh, Senator Keel offered uh, to donate to the scholarship fund uh, $50 for every tie that uh, was sent to, to me, which I guess I'll wear at mid-session summit, um, whether it's virtual or in person. But uh, anyway, uh, thank you all and again. Uh, we'll we'll uh, we'll aim towards the senator uh, said having the final word. Uh, we'll let Representative Christ Tompkins uh, uh, give his opening statements, and then we'll go to Senator Sedman. Yeah, thanks, Robert, and thanks for pulling together the the conference. The panels I've been able to sit in on have been uh, impressively facilitated, despite COVID and the the digital setup. Um, I I started a timer, so hopefully I can. Um, stay within bounds here but um yeah i mean looking towards session uh, a couple of thoughts um very concerned about the southeast economy uh the visitor and fishing industries in particular albeit for somewhat different reasons um and and relatedly i i think it's sort of been a summer long source of concern and frustration about the um sort of hot hands tied nature of CARES Act funds administration and the legislature not being able to convene in special session um, has made that sort of uh, halting and protracted and inefficient um, getting CARES Act money out to where it needs to go. And uh, I am inferring this was referenced earlier, but definitely supportive of a special session to sort of do that 
right and and I think just as importantly also to ensure that the legislature doesn't surrender its constitutional appropriation authorities and um, set precedent that could be referred to in future years with future governors and future legislatures, which may include none of us. Um, so that's the first thought. I mean, general economic concern, and I, I think a sort of support for the special session to be able to have the tools to be able to help the industries um, and the people that are most in need. Um, second thought, I'll, I'll be continuing to work on native language related work, which has sort of been, has been a sort of passion and focus for all my years in the legislature. And um, there's a bill that uh, had some momentum prior to the COVID motivated adjournment, and we'll certainly be back with that next year that has a broad base of support, um, rail belt, rural Alaska, um, teachers, school boards, administrators, et cetera. So excited about that. And then um, two minutes, 15 seconds, and we keep this under three. Uh, my last um, priority is protecting the permanent fund. And I, uh, I think I, I said this recently in a radio interview, but I could not be more violently opposed to liquidating this intergenerational asset to uh, satisfy any short-term political whims um, because the legislature and or governor have, do not have the uh, will or wherewithal to balance their budget. And it simply, I will not be participate in any form or fashion to spending down the permanent fund beyond what is sustainable. So that's a huge concern and priority for me. And I'm at three minutes, two seconds, and I'm gonna clock out right now. Thank you. Senator Stedman, um, your, your opening thoughts and comments. Well, I'd like to just thank everybody for tuning in today. Um, this is kind of a new, I guess a new way of operating that we might have to get used to for a while. The main thing, or the main points I'd like to make in the opening is we need to concentrate on our economy. That has been referenced earlier in the conversations. We've got a lot of unemployment, and we've got some embedded structural problems now with due to this COVID within our, our economy. Um, and that would include the, the uh, fishing industry and particularly the tourism industry, the flow down to City Hall and all those related issues. So we need to work together to try to you know, bring our communities through, through the um, malaise of what we're gonna be dealing with the next several months. I'm a little concerned well, let me stop for just a second. On the positive side, we got healthcare. We had a new hospital uh, expansion done in Ketchikan a few years ago. We are on the uh, precipice of, of starting a $300 million project here in Sitka, which is going to be like bringing a pulp mill into one of our communities. It's going to be that size of a magnitude. It's going to go on for several years. So that, that's going to mask a lot of issues, underlying issues, that we'll still need to address not dissimilar to when the pulp mill shut down and search expanded at the same time, which helped um, the city transition through that issue. Yeah. But I am concerned on the, on the, from a statewide perspective on the Marine Highway. Uh, we've got a report, as all of us are aware, coming out. I'm hoping that it'll be something we can work with. It won't be dead on arrival. If it shows up with zero subsidy, it'll be so dead. Uh, it couldn't find a graveyard fast enough. So um, we're gonna uh, take a good look at that. If it's if it has some balance to it, which I think it will, and it's gonna have some good points to work on, uh, all of us over the next few years, we can you know, start moving the marine highway system forward a little bit so we can ensure that it stays in place for, for, the, for the future. I am concerned about um, the uh, revitalization of the old Budget director's concept of slash and burn and tear the whole house down and sink the marine highway and kick out the pioneers of the pioneer home, basically massacre everything from Adak Island to Dixon Entrance. Uh, I think that might come back with some of the members uh, into the legislature this next winter. So we're going to have to deal with that. Uh, I would agree with uh, my representative, uh, Jonathan, that preserving the permanent fund is a very, very critical issue. And in my opinion, it is more critical than whatever given year the dividend happens to be, the longevity and, and keeping the permanent fund perpetuity. 
So I'm hoping that we will have a discussion this winter on adding more money out of the earnings reserve to the corpus where it's constitutionally protected and keep the uh, permanent fund raiders away. They disguise themselves in many ways, but it all comes down to liquidating large chunks of the permanent fund. So when the money's gone, it's gone. So um, I'm hoping that you know we'll have enough support to to ensure that that doesn't happen because the folks that want to do that, I haven't seen a viable uh, plan or even a, uh, a remotely close mathematical model that shows how we can balance our budget and deal with our our um, payroll demands at the state uh, once the money in the earnings reserve is gone. They don't want to talk about it. All they want to talk about is how big a check they can send out of the permanent fund and vote for me. So uh, we have those, those challenges. So we're going to have a little bit of deja vu, I think, coming back this winter. And we need to make sure that, that um, we preserve the viability of the, of the Marine Highway going forward so we can slowly work through the reconstruction of it, both the physical assets and the, and the financial structure. If it's a separate entity or or whatever we're gonna we're gonna do, so I'd like to uh, make those um, you know opening remarks. Um, there is concern about the school debt reimbursement that policy, not having it reimbursed it affects all our communities, and then the hatcheries, uh, which is intertied with the fishing industry and mariculture also, but we've got a a, um, a, a little shortfall in. Crystal Lake hatchery we have to deal with and, and other related issues. And so we'll, we'll be busy, uh, hopefully working as a, uh, together as much as we can. Uh, we're, we have different agendas sometimes because uh, we're from different, different districts and different political affiliations. But there's a lot of things we work together on. And I think um, most likely we're all going to be back uh, and you know, we'll be. Uh, getting Utrecht out at the at the finance committee and battle for him to protect the permanent fund again. Okay, well, with that, we've got we've touched a lot of broad topics, and we want to dive into a few of those. Um, you know, the first one, the first question up, uh, really goes back to uh, the opening statement that Representative Ortiz made about a special session possibly needed for just even empowering the governor's own authority to operate under emergency powers. Uh, one of the questions that came up uh, during our last couple of days uh, in discussions about the, uh, the CARES Act distribution of funds to small businesses, that program being oversubscribed by about, um, oh gosh, about $120 million before they shut it down. Um, and if the economies are focused, would that be a priority place to um, reappropriate funds that might have been laid out for other programs that were not utilized? Um, just wondering if, um, first of all, what your sense is from your colleagues uh, about the special session and how, um, you know, what, what topics uh, might, might be on the table for that? Is that, who's the question directed to? Uh, well, well, we'll start, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll try to take one from the Senate and the House, and if, if others want to uh, weigh in on it, fine. Otherwise, we'll, we'll just move around. But Senator, your mic is open, so what are your thoughts? <laughs> We're not going to have a special session. If we had a special session, um, it takes 30 days' notice. We have an election coming, uh, so that's not going to happen. Uh, when uh, we're in session, you cannot have um, – can't do any fundraising. So is it after, the, after the election, after the election, after the election um, I think it's unlikely that uh, it's not, you know, totally out of the question, but I'd be more surprised if we had one than we didn't. Uh, there's various political reasons for that. Uh, so, uh, and as far as the efficiency of dealing with uh, the emergency, um, powers that the governor has versus the efficiency that the legislature has, uh, I think the legislature is a little less efficient and may actually slow things down. So uh, we don't have a, we don't have a perfect system. Uh, the uh, money came in a lot quicker than the, the policy uh, creation could handle, frankly, and there's 
there's errors in it. There's no doubt about that and problems that we have to work through. But I would be more surprised if we had a special session than if we didn't. Okay. Um, Representative Christ Tompkins, do you have any other sense that um, your your body might uh, view it the same differently or thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree there's, there's zero chance before the election that there'll be a special session. Um, yeah, I mean, af afterwards, the, I mean, my senator may sort of have more more insight to this, but I mean, the governor is a pretty important variable, both, I mean, there's a, in the House, there's a block of legislators who are closely aligned with the governor, and in the past, as far as special sessions go, have, you know, kind of taken a cue from the governor's office, whether they are on board or not on board for a special session. And I, I, I mean, the two ways a special session happens, governor calls it, or you've got um, two thirds of all legislators, so 40 of 60 saying, hey, I'm in. And if there's a block of 21 who aren't, aren't in for a special session, then there's not gonna be a special session. So um, I think it, a, lo a large extent, you know, it, it would depend on the governor, um, what, what he is looking for. And um, I, I imagine the, the general election might be to some extent a variable there, um, but uh, yeah, hard to say post, post election. Thank you. So another pandemic related budget issue uh, that concerns education, we'll start uh, allowing this towards Representative Story uh, for starters, since she's the co-chair of that. Uh, but um, you know, obviously the impact on our schools is profound. Uh, enrollment's down. Uh, we, we're seeing a complication with uh, correspondence students uh, being enrolled outside of the district and uh, what what uh, you know are the remedies that the state has to to help these districts out, or what what are the thoughts uh, at this time? Uh, yeah, thank you for that question. I wanted to add uh, just to reassure reassure everyone that when I talked to uh, Commissioner Johnson the other day, uh, school payments will be coming through all for this all through the school year on schedule. He said it is actually the summer the the last quarter is where we will have to patchwork what we need to do based on what information we find out this year about our finances with enrollments. But he wanted to reassure school districts they will be getting their payments through the school year no matter what their enrollments are. Um, so I think I would have to say if they there is the option to redo a count, uh, a 20 day count at a later part. Uh, because obviously in the, th the first 20 day count, the school districts that had an increase in enrollment for their correspondence kids, they will, they will get more money. Um, that is the way things work. But then in the districts that are set to lose enrollment, uh, that will really be a challenge for them. And I would have to look to my colleagues to see if because of COVID, there was, we districts did not receive the money, the full amount of money they needed for the federal assistance. And I would want to mention that there is um, federal assistance in both the House and the Senate plan for more dollars for education that um, I'm assuming they're going to get to a finish line on something um, this year. So that's going to help schools. As far as what we can do as the legislature, we could do a supplemental. Um, I don't know, you know our budget situation, uh, but when I think, I t listened to our superintendent the other day and she said, we are going to have a desperate need to provide summer school for everyone who wants it this year. There's been such a loss in learning uh, for kids and families who want that for their students next summer. That is a critical need. And so, our districts are gonna be coming forward. House education and Senate education are gonna be having a meeting in the next couple of weeks to hear from the superintendents and to listen to their recommendations for how to meet the needs of our students going forward. And so we do have some tools at our disposal. It's a matter of uh, what, a matter of citizens at sometimes public pressure coming forward to take care of our kids. But again, we know these are our future workforce. Uh, these are our future citizens who are uh, we want to have every opportunity, all kids every opportunity 
So we've got work to do and we need to adequately fund it. Thank you. Senator Keel, um, your thoughts on the school budget issues and count? Well, I mean, you know, the fundamentally the issue we have here is that our rules for schools were written in 1998. Well, some of them before that. I mean, you know, 22 years ago, I was closer to Marcos's hairdo than I was to Bert's, and now I'm closer to Bert's, right? Um, so things, you know, we're not operating under the usual assumptions of a standard ordinary school year where everybody sends their kids off, you know, in August, September, and, and uh, uh, May we're done. You know, you have graduation, right? None of that happened last year, but schools still had to contract with all their teachers for a full year, not necessarily knowing if they're going back in person this fall, some are in, some are hybrid, some are changing partway through the year. It's a mess. Um, so and I think the easiest and best solution right now would probably be for, um, <laughs> usually I'm so uh, opposed to the governor using extra powers, but in this pandemic to have the Department of Education announce that they're using last year's count. Um, that's basically how schools uh, hired teachers and contracted staff and, and got things ramped up. That I think is not a whole lot more money than, uh, than we'd get with this October's count, whatever that comes out to be. Um, and, and Andy said it, um, and Bert and Jonathan are right, we're, we're, the, the money's tight, it's really tight. Um, schools are uh, so critically important that I think we really have to, have to handle that. So um, it's, it's gonna be a tough one. You know, and even then you have to provide something for the couple of statewide correspondence programs that really are taking on thousands more kids. Um, but that's a relatively small fix um, if, if we start everybody out with, with last October's count instead of this year's. Um, we'll have to make some adjustments to get through this uh, uncommon thing. And you know, it's one of the few places where I think it probably does pay to spend a little more, but I'll go back to Dan's opening comment, right? We are not all going to get everything we would like to have, we ought to have, we could use, and, and not just raid the earnings reserve and do with the earnings reserve of the permanent fund what the legislature and the governors over the last five, six years have done with the constitutional budget reserve account. In case anybody wasn't watching, zero it is the answer, right? Not okay. So it's, it's going to be a tough spot, but I, I think that's one of the things that... Um, that it would really pay to make an adjustment to. Um, politics, that'll be challenging, uh, but that's a fight worth having. Right. Um, so a question popped up in relation to your uh, executive um, authorities uh, statement there, and I guess it's kind of budget related, so maybe Representative Ortiz and Senator Stedman, um, are there other options to extend the governor's um, uh, emergency powers or the pandemic declaration. Uh, we've seen a lot of use of the LVNA, RPLs. Uh, is that what we're stuck with outside of special session? I'm going to defer to my uh, senator on that. He's got a lot more experience on that issue and a lot more, uh, you know, uh, background as to how these things come about. And um, uh, yeah, he's my senator. I'll go to him. <laughs> That puts me on the hot seat, but um, I actually I think it was a good move to go through LBNA versus the quagmire of the full le full legislature. Frankly, for the speed of it, um, and there was some uh, bumps in the road. There's no doubt about that. Uh, the governor's uh, emergency powers will expire uh, into the uh, real late fall, maybe 30 days before. Or so we head into session. Uh, once we come into session, it'll be a different ball game. So we need to, uh, I guess, work through that issue of the transition. I don't know if he's going to, you know, want to extend it or not yet. But uh, we will be in session in January. So we'll have to wait and see. Uh, the uh, if there's a need for LBNA to to uh, reconvene, I'm sure the LBNA would reconvene. But just for those watching, LBNA is kind of the interim. Financial Committee, uh, joint between the House and the Senate, and it authorizes the acceptance of federal money. It can't appropriate money, and if the LBNA committee decides not to take action, uh, 45 days afterwards, the governor can do it anyway and receive the funds. 
uh, as a general rule. So, uh, but we're always standing by the committee to to take action if we need to. Thank you. Uh, Representative Hannon, you've spent almost your entire life in the educational arena. Um, and so if you have any comments on, on the, the K-12 uh, question earlier, fine. But later on today, we're going to hear from the university system, uh, chancellor and, and president. Um, we all know how close the UAS came to practically disappearing. Um, just wondering what, what insights you have on, on how the state can, can better support that institution and, of course, then the conference as well. But um, your, your insights, and insights on, on, on that topic? Well, you know, one of the <laughs> a couple things on education. Um, our university system can be our crown jewel, but it depends on our K-12 or our pre-K through 12 system doing the piece to make sure that we're ready for students to go to university and thrive and flourish. Um, you know, we, the university has really suffered the last few years and universities across the US as, um, you know, some political rhetoric about education being frivolous if you didn't have a goal, you know, if you weren't generating a job at the end of your degree, then was it worth investing in? And of course, um, anyone, you know, as a parent, if you've got a child who says, I'm not sure if I'm going to major in philosophy or engineering, every parent immediately goes, engineering, engineering, you can pay back your loans the day you graduate. <laughs> um, and the philosophy student is, whoa, there's graduate school or, gosh, guess you're moving home. Um, but does that mean that there isn't value in producing philosophers? Now, I don't think we have a philosophy degree in the UA system. We have a university system that has been very focused on providing uh, professionals for, edu you know, for Alaska's economy. So petroleum engineering, marine science, fisheries biologists, teachers, nurses. Um, and we've tried to grow those programs, especially in Southeast, to meet demands and needs that we have. We know that every nurse and every teacher graduating from the University of Alaska system can go to work in Alaska as soon as they graduate. We have a huge deficit for all of our professional degrees in Alaska. We need biologists, we need engineers, we need surveyors, we need mine technicians. Um, and any time we stop that systemic growth, it means that on down the road, we've got to turn to somewhere else and we've lost part of that economy. Um, and, you know, since there's been a shortage of those professions across the nation, it's also meant that as we've cut the university budget or as a professor has looked at it and thought, am I going to stay here in Juneau and continue to be a professor or gosh, there are five other universities that are also looking for this. They're making changes. Those, you know, we're losing both students um, out of concerns and programs and professionals who lead those because there are other states in the union that are offering them jobs. Um, I don't ever look at an investment in education as a dollar wasted because even though we might not be able to measure what you're going to do with that philosophy degree today, we know that an investment in education in the long run is a good dollar investment. And if we can keep those dollars invested in Alaska, it benefits our economy um, with a ripple effect. So keeping young Alaskans, uh, retooling older Alaskans, those are parts that our system has been very good at and we need to make sure we're continuing to do. Um, you know, especially with the threat of loss of UAS, we've all gone, hey, that, that campus has been very focused on job programs. Um, you know, mining training has been one of its, you know, funded by industry and putting those people to work uh, the day they graduate, diesel mechanics, you know, any port in Alaska, there's a want ad for someone who wants to work in diesel mechanics. And we can't, we can't train enough, fast enough. So um, I, I never want someone to diminish, diminish education as we can put it off. Because if we lose them, 
uh, to another state, to another program, they're not likely to come back to us. So. Thank you, and that's a, that's a great reminder um, to you know, everyone online, you know, why it is that we stress our support for the university system so much because they, that is our future and uh, it's, it's, it's vitally important to us. Um, we've got about 15 minutes left before this panel ends and we have uh, Senator Murkowski to join us. I want to give you each just a couple of minutes to, um, to you know, uh, touch on, touch base on any other topic you'd like to or um, urge the, the members to be thinking in a certain mindset we didn't touch the marine highway system because you guys, uh, you all, every single one of you are rock solid in that. Um, and we just goes without, hopefully it goes without saying how much we appreciate um, how you've been able to defend and support the system uh, this last two years, but it's been increasingly difficult to do so. But um, you know, the pandemic and the response and the recovery, that's really been a lot of our focus uh, this week and going forward, you know, how do we keep the economy intact um, and we certainly appreciate the, all your efforts that each of you have made in so many long hours uh, this, this year, um, regardless of session. But we want to make sure that we're positioning uh, Juno to be welcoming for the legislature when it comes back. You know, the, the, the communities, uh, Juno's talked about rapid testing, all the different things that go into both the, what we need for uh, our economy of scale, tourism, as well as legislators. But... Uh, anything on your mind for a couple of minutes each, please? And we'll go in the exact opposite order. So, Senator Stedman, uh, you're first up. Well, thank you. A um, couple things we didn't touch on. Uh, the capital move issue, alive and well. Uh, continual migration north. I think we need to circle the wagons around the Juno delegation and try to work with them to protect the capital. Uh, that would include special sessions out of Juno. Clearly, the judge's decision the legislature, it's their prior uh, prerogative where they meet, not the governor's. So we need to reinforce that with our colleagues and don't give an inch on moving the capital because it's, it, you never get it back. And I'll be working with uh, Senator Keel on that um, as we try to deal with some of the uh, issues. Uh, housing is one of them, uh, one of the, the big issues that w will help. So I'll, I'll work with him on that. The other big issue that we haven't touched on is the court ruling on the state issuing debt. That could be very far reaching um, beyond just the clear, the clearly delineated, you know, we can issue debt for capital improvements. Um, but there's a lot of other issues out there uh, relating to debt. So that could have a huge impact on our municipalities, uh, our utilities. Um, and, so on and so forth. So we'll have uh, lots of irons in the fire as we work forward, uh, look forward in, into the winter, and hopefully we'll resolve some of these issues. But I, my concern is we don't go backwards. We don't go backwards on the Marine Highway, we don't go backwards on the capital move, and we don't go backwards on losing the permanent fund for future generations. All right, thank you very much. Representative Price Tompkins, your two minutes. Great, timer started, Robert. Um, yeah, uh, two, two points, um, ferries, I, I, yeah, appreciate those comments, Robert, and I think that represents where we're at and also our colleagues over in Kodiak and elsewhere in coastal Alaska, um, uh, maybe with one exception, but <laughs> don't need to dwell there. Uh, and um, yeah, I, I, I also think it's worth noting that Southeast Conference's leadership and your leadership, Robert, uh, I at least have valued tremendously. Um, so thank you for that. And hopefully that will be ongoing into next year. Um, so that was the first thought on ferries. And then the second thought is, I, th I think a broader concern coming out of the primary election of, of sort of um, a, a Matsuification of, of um, the legislature uh, and 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 I mean I, I've got a letter next to my name but I sort of have a you know first in Alaska and second anything else kind of mentality and um, you know I didn't always agree with John Coghill on every issue but he was a hell of a legislator and Alaska to his core and a really decent thoughtful statesman and um, I think it's pretty what happened in August is pretty concerning. I don't actually think it's reflective of what a majority of Alaskans feel regardless of their ideologies. And 
I, I think that's sort of a rising political tide to be aware of that the sort of Matsu flavor of politics, which by the way is dead bad for this region, um, is on the rise and it, it's gonna be something to contend with in the legislature next year. All right, thank you. Um, Matsudification, that's a new, new, new term, so I've written that one down. Uh, so um, and I think um, we, we might have lost uh, Representative Story. Sound like her internet connection was pretty sketchy there when she was speaking. So um, Representative Hannon. Well, thank you, and um, I'll try and be better with a timer. I always learn tips from my colleagues. You know, the teacher and me, we can ramble all day. Um, we, we have got to continue to educate uh, our peers from other places. You know, the, the cuts of two years ago to the marine highways took a whole year to educate some of our interior legislators to go, Cutting the marine highway system impacts the military base in Fairbanks because we don't have people riding on it. And that's how a lot of military families transit in and out of Alaska. Um, we all already knew that, but the fact that our neighbors didn't completely understand that the marine highway is the economic engine, not just in the coast, but it contributes to the entire state. Um, and that's vital. And uh, the provincial thought that my part of the state's more important than your part of the state, that matsuification, we love that new, that new word that we just learned, and that's the pleasure of being a legislator. He invented it, we all get to steal it from him. Um, but we need to make sure that we're working with rural communities across the state so that Alaska isn't just one city um, with suburbs and commuters into it. Alaska remains a diverse state with rural communities able to thrive and meet their needs. And they need power, and they need schools, and they need intact industries, and they need internet. Um, and all of those things cost money. Um, so bridging the state and making sure that they know how beautiful Southeast is and how much we contribute to the economy. Thank you. And on that note about internet, um, we know it's pretty, I, I figured that's what happens to represent this story. So while we've got you there, why don't you go ahead and uh, take a couple of minutes to give us your uh, closing thoughts. Uh, thank you. Uh, I caught the last part of uh, Rep. Hannon's comments and I so think we need to be moving to uh, looking at two-year budgets. Our Alaska Marine Highway System needs a two-year budget. How are we gonna market? How are we gonna get the independent travelers? It would provide so much economic stability to our regions. And I'm hoping that recommendation comes out of the reshaping work group. Uh, same with our schools. We need two-year budgets. We, to attract and keep our professionals, this, it's not working. And if we keep doing things that are not working, we know Einstein said that's the definition of insanity. So we really need to look at our policies when we are setting our, our budgets and looking at that system. And we know we're, um, you know, in the budget situation that we are, we need to work as a team to get a budget plan through. It's gonna be a team effort. We know that, nothing will pass. I used to think it was just the majority in the House, the majority in the Senate. Governor signs it. Well, governor doesn't sign it. 45 to override. So anything that comes up with a sustainable plan to give all of us certainty, to have our communities thriving, to say, uh, keep your families here. Your schools are gonna get your kids a great job here in Alaska. There's so much at stake with the work we have to do this year. And you guys are the ones who help us out the most. A Couple of my uh, good bills this year, my Mariculture bill, came from a constituent into my office. Uh, a hydro bill came, um, sweetheart dam, thank you, Duff. Uh, there's just, we need to hear from you. We need to have um, your um, citizens, you have more power than you think you do. And you, if you didn't, you must have seen that in my first session. I was uh, stunned by the amount of e emails we had with all the cuts. And people were saying, uh, this is not typical, Andy. Uh, we uh, really 
we are hearing unbelievable amount of testimony and people calling in and that's what it's going to take to get Alaska the budget that protects essential services that are critical for quality of life here and I'm glad to uh, be working with everyone here on the panel and everyone cares deeply. That's what gives me hope about our upcoming session. Everyone cares deeply about the state of Alaska. And so uh, thank you all, because I know you guys love this place too. And so uh, let's do it and thank you. All right, thank you, Representative. And um, Representative Ortiz, uh, while we're in the house, uh, your closing two minutes, please. You bet, and I will hold it to two minutes. Uh, just first of all, I'd like to associate myself with the comments made uh, by my senator and by the representative from uh, District 35, Senator or Representative Price Tompkins, on the importance of making sure as we move forward to protect the permanent fund for future generations. I'm committed to that as well. It's critical for the long-term health in so many ways uh, of our state and, and for our Alaskans ac across the board. Um, and so we wanted to make sure and reconnect with those two folks uh, on that issue. You know, also, Senator Stedman talked about uh, the creep to Anchorage, uh, centralization, capital. That doesn't just relate to the capital. I mean, it doesn't relate to the legislature. Uh, it also relates to job creep in general. Um, and with this, I would like to point out that the DPS issue and uh, centralization of dispatch is still out there. I can tell you all that our um, borough mayor, Rodney Dow, just did a great job of representing uh, the interests of, uh, of Southern Southeast Alaska and, and all of Southeast Alaska on that particular issue. Um, I was proud to uh, serve with him on the, I came in at the very end of that committee, uh, but he just did a great job, which leads me to my final point in that as we move forward here, we need to always be connecting with the communities that we represent, the community governors, uh, governments that we represent, uh, because as we go through these difficult times, we need to make sure and not leave the local communities and the local municipalities out of the out in the cold in relationship to how the state and those entities interact, and so and 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 how what our role is in making sure that they're on, on sound footing as well. So that that's all I got. Thanks. All right, thank you. And so um, ending in full circle in the Senate, Senator Keel. Thanks, Robert, and, and thanks everyone. Um, I can't believe there's more than 100 people on watching us yammer, um, but I imagine you'll drop off while I talk. Um, uh, listen, I just I want to thank um, my colleagues from, from Central and Southern Southeast. Uh, what, what Bert said about the capital move and what Dan enhanced about how it really is bigger than any one branch or any one department. Um, this has been an incredible team effort the last several years, and we have gotten tremendous support as a region. And um, it, it is absolutely bigger than, than just uh, you know, <laughs> the, the Juno delegation was uh, fighting over, uh, over a new one, a uh, new foot in the door just uh, earlier this week. Um, and I think we made some great progress uh, kicking those toes back out of the door so we could slam it shut on that particular department. Um, but dispatch is a great example. Right when when Mayor Dial was here in my office in the Capitol building, um, you know, anything I can do to help with that issue, let me know because we're there. We need to be there for one another as a region, um, and and you know he he knows that, and and Bert and Dan know, uh, and Jonathan that I've got your back. I mean, I I was born and raised in Anchorage, right? I had that high school job, you know, and and mine one of mine was shipping uh, uh, art prints off to galleries to sell them to tourists. Uh, and I would send them these exotic locations I couldn't find on a map, like Ketchikan, right? You want to put all our public safety dispatch up there? Man, I don't know. Uh, let's, <laughs> let's keep that local. So as we look forward, um, I think there are going to be a lot of things that we need to keep working together on as a region. And that's what makes Southeast Conference so valuable and so vital. Not everybody's going to agree on everything, you know. New EIS for the roadless rule is out, and I think different members of the, the legislative delegation for all of Southeast are going to come down in different places. We'll squabble on this and that, uh, but when it comes to those big issues, 
and when it comes to a strong fiscal future for our entire state, protecting the permanent fund for next generations. I think you'll find us all together. When it comes to the ferry system, I guarantee you'll find us all together. I, I couldn't, wasn't, couldn't have been happier than yesterday here in uh, Bert and, and Robert on the, the working group, uh, pushing back on some of the cockamamie ideas that as, as Bert said, would have landed that report in a graveyard uh, instantly. And, and, and frankly, would have made it harder to get to some of the necessary reforms that are going to come out of that. So um, I'll just circle back one last time to the notion of a special session. I agree that one after the uh, election's a long shot politically. I think it would be our first lame duck uh, since statehood. I uh, haven't researched that thoroughly. But there are things other than money that we need to do, right? Changes in regulations that were only possible because we're in a state of emergency that let hospice function, that let home health function um, without strangers coming into your excuse me, coming into your home. They let schools function because uh, they were able to waive a regulation that required in-person face-to-face PE for every, I mean, you know, stuff like that. Um, I, I think we'll have a month or two of chaos uh, if, we, if we just let that expire. So as we look to the bright spots in Southeast going forward, entrepreneurship and mariculture, in small business, in the breweries, in the, you know, the value add to our fish, uh, if we can get a good run again someday. I, I, It'll come back. It'll come back, right? Uh, did some pick some fish in Bristol Bay. You got to have optimism when you're fishing. Um, I, I think there's a lot that we can do together, and we're looking forward to working with Southeast Conference and to relying on Southeast Conference for your leadership on our economy and and our region uh, long into the future. So thanks again for having us. We really appreciate it. You know, you guys are just awesome for so many different reasons, but also for getting all that concluded at 10:15 at our. Uh, at our appointed time um and so as you can see i mean you think we had this thing just just orchestrated just perfectly because at this very moment we have our you senior senator from uh the united states senate joining us so senator uh you've just uh, uh joined us uh, as we concluded our uh, state officials uh panel where you see our two senators and four representatives from the the House and uh, and Senate here in Alaska, and so we know you're in in transit, and yet you still have time to uh, to zoom in today. So good morning, thank you, and uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, and you know I would not uh, ask to be included on your program twice, as you point out. I am in transit, uh, but as I was flying across country, um, I got a got a phone call from Russ Vaught, who is head of, of Office and Management and Budget, and you will probably know that's where the, uh, the uh, final EIS has been hanging out for a while on the road list, and uh, we have received word that um, earlier this morning the Forest Service did release its final EIS for the Tonga-specific uh, road list rule, and it does contain the six alternatives, but I'm very pleased that the Forest Service has identified a full exemption for, from the 2001 roadless rule as the preferred alternative. That's been the preferred alternative, certainly from the delegation, I know it is for many of you. Um, it does note that uh, the full exemption would provide maximum additional timber harvest, opportunities. Uh, I know that uh, as, we, as we look to the economy there in Southeast, uh, we, know that the, we know the impact that we have seen when it is difficult, if not impossible at times, to get a, a reliable uh, supply of, of timber. Um, I, I know that there's going to be um, a great deal of excitement from many and a great deal of frustration from some. Uh, some who would suggest that somehow or other this designation is going to uh, uh, mean that we're going to see the, the Tongas uh, about to be clear cut. And I think it's important to put it into, into context. A full exemption would make a net of 168,000 acres of old growth available in the decades to come. That's literally 1%, a little less than 1% of the Tongas. But we're still going to hear the, the concerns. From, from some about how this will, will, will devastate our, our forest. But I think those of you at Southeast Con Conference know as well as anybody 
that the roadless rule is not just about timber. It is about reasonable access for a wide variety of users, whether it is for a renewable energy that we work so hard to build, whether for recreation, whether for mineral, it is for all pieces of the Southeast economy. Um, uh, where we are right now is this final EIS is going to set us up for a record of decision. That final rule is going to be in about 30, well, 30 days from now. So uh, we've been waiting for this for a long time, um, a long time. And uh, we are getting close to, uh, close to uh, a place where I think we can say that as Alaskans in the Southeast, um, when we're talking about access, that access can be more meaningful and, uh, and allow us to have uh, greater opportunities for, for greater economy and, and certainly greater economic um, recovery during this time. So wanted to share that, uh, that piece of, of news with everybody while you're all still gathered. I love the, the photograph in back of you there in Ketchikan, all the fine people waving and smiling and saying hello. It makes me feel like I'm, I'm back in Ketchikan instead of in the Seattle airport. But, you know, you gather where you gather. So, so thank you for letting me share this update um, and, uh, and, and good news on, on, on the Alaska Specific Roadless Plan. Thank you for all your hard work on that. I know it's um, from day one uh, of your tenure, it was on your, on your plate and you kept uh, whacking away at it till we uh, got yeah, here today. Um, you know, one question that, that comes to mind is, are there uh, additional, perhaps executive uh, actions that could happen to, um, you know, to implement changes in the plan and, and does it impact um, some of the opportunities for the landless um, the topic or even the veterans uh, allocations that's been looked at? Um, do you know that off, offhand? You know, I, I, I don't, Robert. Um, uh, what I have right now, I haven't been able to, to see the, the full uh, the full Alaska specific role will take, we're obviously going to take a, a considered look at it. One of the reasons that it's, it's taken as long as it has is because it is, it is long and um, uh, just getting the printing of this document done took some time. So we're going to be studying that. Hopefully we'll have uh, more answers more readily, but, but the good news is, is that it is, it is out and, uh, and now this 30 day clock begins to, to toll. So Excellent. Well, thank you. I know it's impacted the cost of energy projects um, in many, many places. Um, Angoon's Thayer Creek uh, had, um, you know, visual impact uh, issues that uh, were kind of curious, as well as the, the cake inner tie. Um, right. Those are so many different uh, cost considerations. So uh, thank you for, uh, uh, for bringing all that hard work uh, to the fore and for uh, using Southeast Conference's annual meeting to make that announcement and uh, getting that out to the, uh, the, the hundreds that are gathered here today to see it well, live. And, it was and, and, and I think it is important, you know, this, this was, we talk about our, our delegation and the team effort, and, and this has been a team effort at all different levels. And so um, as, as, we're, as we're sharing this, this, this news, I think um, I want to make sure that I give that equal shout out to Don and Dan for for uh, everybody pulling together on this. So, so thanks for letting me beam in again. And uh, I know that this is the end of the conference. Hopefully it was good and productive and um, you've, you've shared a lot of, of uh, good initiatives. So thanks for all the good work at Southeast Conference. Thank you, Senator, and you have safe travels home. Okay, take care, bye-bye everybody. So with that, um, historic announcement. We will go ahead and officially conclude this one. The, the last question that was in the box was a shout out of thanks uh, that was initiated from Thorn Bay, but um, really comes from all of us uh, because the, the real key thing uh, in, in my mind is that, you know, while you're, you, you get elected by a local district, each of you step up to the plate for the region and the state, and we really appreciate that uh, perspective and the, and the teamwork that you all bring to the region. So, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to the Southeast Conference. Let us know how we can assist. And again, uh, thank you all for what you're doing and continue to do.
so, and for joining us today. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and take uh, just a couple minutes break um, so you can stretch those legs. And we've got an exciting uh, insights into our university system. And we're gonna go ahead and uh, we'll be uh, starting back up at 10.30. So let's put our, our sponsored page up there because we certainly wanna thank each and every one of them for uh, their support to make the conference effective. And um, we'll see you at 10.30.
Okay, well, welcome back and it's great to see our next panel live and in person on our Zoom virtual conference. Uh, we're so excited to um, at least have an opportunity to, to, to see you, even if we can't see you in person. Um, it's been something that, um, um, well, you can see my photo of the day behind me. We, we certainly uh, take full advantage as, uh, as you both have, have seen us in action, know that we, uh, we do, do love to get together and, and network and collaborate together. And one of the things that we do at each of our annual meetings is um, our scholarship auction, which has been ongoing on a virtual platform this week. <clears throat> and I just want to remind folks that um, um, that is still ongoing. We, what we've done is we've, we've got the, um, the silent auction that's going, and then we side by side, we have a raise the paddle um, auction, uh, or uh, like a GoFundMe site that is uh, ongoing for those that perhaps get outbid and they still want to uh, add a donation of support. We're up to uh, uh, $10,000 so far. So uh, it's been a good outpouring. And Senator Keel just made a very interesting um, a donation for, uh, he noticed uh, my, my tieless attire and uh, told the membership that for every tie that they send to the office, uh, he's gonna donate $50 to that account. So um, I suspect that at our mid-session summit, I will be uh, tied up uh, in a lot of different ways. So all in good fun and support for uh, what's, you know, we titled the crown jewel of, uh, of Southeast because we really do value uh, the university system and see um, uh, so many different ways the, the value of preparing our workforce and just at all the different ways that um, the university system plays a role in our economy. So um, thank you both for, for, uh, for, for being with us today. Um, we're going to go ahead and get, get started. Uh, and I'm going to uh, just turn it over to, uh, to uh, Chancellor Carey who we've had the, the pleasure of um, having interactions with for many, many uh, sessions during her tenure here at uh, UAS, and so glad to see her there at the, at the helm. But I'm uh, just gonna ask you, um, uh, Chancellor, to open up with a few remarks, and then if you would introduce President Pat Pitney, who we've had the pleasure of working with in different capacities over the years. Uh, very excited to see you there as well. Um, but I'm going to fade to black and let you both have um, your opening remarks about what's what's uh, going on at the university system, how we can help support, and then uh, we'll open up for some some Q and A. So good morning. Well, thank you, Robert. Really, it's really great. To, I wish we could all be together. I love Southeast Conference. When I first came to Juno um, four and a half years ago, it was one of the first conferences I attended, and I learned so much about Southeast Alaska. And I really just want to say to everyone, thank you so much for donating um, to the uh, scholarship fund through the auction. It's, it's a great opportunity to really help our students. And I just want to thank all of you for being willing to give in that way. I'm Karen Carey, and I am the interim chancellor um, at UAS. And I was appointed to this position in June, right after Rick Caulfield retired. And um, I told him I was presenting today, and he said, be sure to tell everybody hi. He's having a great time in his retirement, visiting his grandchild in Massachusetts. So he is well and doing very, and, and, and very happy with retirement. So prior to becoming chancellor, I was the provost at UAS for four and a half years. And as you know, UAS has been through an awful lot in recent years. And we feel extremely fortunate that the Board of Regents has resented the talk of the merger. Our students, faculty, and staff are relieved, and we're moving forward in a, in a very positive direction. Of course, with COVID, our enrollments are lower than we hoped, but not as low as we expected. So we're actually doing pretty well. We have about 120 students living on campus. We're offering face-to-face -face classes in ceramics, carving, science labs, health, maritime, at our technical education center and in Sitka and Ketchikan. We've increased our dual enrollment population, which allows high school students to take college level classes. And we've upped our enrollments with students from rural communities across the state. We have a little over 2000 students taking classes right now at UAS 
and we're working hard on our enrollment and our retention. In terms of COVID, we began planning in late spring for how fall would look. In March, we went to all virtual classes. We have a masking policy on campus as well as a six foot distancing policy. And everybody on campus has been totally in compliance with our COVID policies. So we've been able to put up plastic sheeting in front of our faculty and sheeting between our students and our science labs. And for the spring semester, we've already decided that we will look very much like we do right now in the fall. Our programs are strong, marine biology, fisheries, maritime, education, behavioral health, native languages and cultures, environmental science and mind training are just some of the strongest programs we have where we continue to offer occupational endorsements, associate's degrees, bachelor's degrees, and master's degrees. So it's a great time to pursue a degree or retool skills with online classes at UAS. The Southeast community has incredibly, been incredibly supportive of UAS. And again, I wanna thank all of you for that support. Hecla Greens Creek and Kensington Mines have been supporting our mine training program for years. Our education programs have been supported by our local school districts and our native, our native languages and native studies programs have been supported by the local tribes, Sea Alaska Heritage, Clinkett Haida Central Council and Gold Belt. We wanna partner with more businesses across Southeast, especially in this time where the state needs to increase its workforce and during these times of COVID. So I look forward to hearing from all of you. Um, UAS is, is on the move, we're doing well, and I just look forward to when we can all be in person again. So at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to President Pitney. I think everyone knows Pat. I did not know Pat. Um, I'd met her probably a couple of times, but I didn't really know her. She's just a great individual. She's doing great things for the university. And I think everyone is pleased that, that Pat was willing to take on this hard, hard position right now. So let me turn it over to President Pitney. Thanks everyone. I, I'm super excited to, to be here in this capacity. I've enjoyed, I don't know, I think two or three Southeast Conference um, fall conferences. And in fact, the first time I went to Southeast Conference was down in Prince Rupert. And it was the first time I'd ever been on a float plane. Now, I've been on it on a float plane several times since then. And, uh, and, and I have, I continue to have my home in Southeast. So a, a bit of, bit of a convert. Um, I am living in Fairbanks now. Um, but I keep my home in, in the Southeast and I'll be down on occasion. So, but it, it's been, it's been an interesting re reintroduction uh, to the university. And my primary goal is to create a sense of stability. Um, I, I believe strongly that the success of the university system is the degree to which our communities embrace what we do. And, and that we are integrally, integrally tied uh, to the economies of our communities. And, based on you know Karen's description of her program suite um, that 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 it goes for the University of the Southeast and Juno, Ketchikan and Sitka as well. The um, the focus I'm trying to say is yes we're going to be a smaller institution. There there's there's no there's no question when you know, we've had seven out of the last eight years of year over year reductions in state funding. Uh, our base at the end of the compact will be, be cut by $120 million. That, that's a significant reduction. There, there, it is going to be smaller. But my interest is focusing on the programs that are delivering in the communities and 
getting everybody to understand those programs that are there, they're, they're there. We might have to trim on the edge, but those programs are there. Um, I'm excited about what Catch Can is doing with their partnership with Coast Guard and Avtech for um, maritime occupations. I'm excited about the Fish Tech program out of Sitka, but and very excited about the programs, um, education programs, and the fisheries program and ocean sciences program and um, or marine sciences program in in Juno, but also the direct connect to the mining industry. So those programs are there, those campuses are there, and the communities can depend on them. Those campuses are also there in a way that can leverage the other programs that exist across the entire system. And so, you know, please, please use your local campus. And if they, they don't have exactly what you're looking at, they'll seek to leverage what exists in the, the rest of the system to meet your needs. Um, I do want to point out that you know, the university is key to, to the underlying economic recovery. Um, and, you know, we must invest in education because if we don't invest in education, you're going you're gonna to take care of people in some other way. And it's interesting to note that every dollar reduced from the university through the by this administration hasn't been saved. It has been reallocated into Department of Public Safety and Department of Corrections. So if we're not putting our money in education, we're still putting money towards help or taking care of people. What's better for your economy in the long run? And I think that's a, a really important piece of policy understanding where do we want to see this state in five and 10 years? I want to see a state with a strong economy. I want to see a state with the university integrally tied to the economies of your local community. So with that, I am happy to take questions. All right, well, thank you very, very much. We're, again, very, very appreciative of the fact that even though we hate losing anybody from Southeast, uh, you weren't going to get much gardening in this summer anyway, so uh, uh, we really appreciate that. I think there's um, uh, you're, you're the right person at the right time for there, and we've certainly appreciated working with you uh, in your various capacities um, uh, previously. You know, and one thing I just want to recognize uh, before uh, uh, we get into the Q&A is that uh, for the membership, we, our appreciation to um, Chancellor Caulfield, uh, some of the, the and those before we uh, at his uh, retirement party had recognized him with an outstanding lifetime service award uh, just for his dedicated service to the communities, the businesses, and students in Southeast. And I just want to make sure that um, that was something that we had hoped to convey in person, but we were able to do that virtually at his retirement party. So that was, that was excellent. Um, so um, a couple of, of questions that have come in. Um, and we'll jump right into uh, one has to do with just in, enrollment. Um, if there's any sort of incentive that uh, that is being provided to students to sign up for um, for the university program, I'll let uh, uh, Chancellor Kerry take that one. I think they do have some uh, uh, scholarship support. Yeah, we have tremendous scholarship support. <clears throat> If a student is interested in getting a scholarship, they just need to contact our scholarship office. We have a number of scholarships that go wanting every year. And we would be really, we would really like to give that money away to deserving students. So we're also looking at doing some work with um, CBJ. Um, we're hoping that they expand the CARES money and extend that into beyond December 31st, where we could offer some assistance to students interested in taking courses at UAS um, and who, who are definitely affected by COVID. Also working with AYEC, they've got a program going on for a group of students that are doing some work in childcare. 
and their students are interested in coming to UAS to start on their uh, general education requirements. So AYEC is going to put up um, enough money for those students to take a three credit class this spring. So there's a lot of opportunity and there are monies out there for students that are interested. Um, if people have specific questions about that, they can go ahead and, and contact me. I'd be happy to let them know how to get in touch with the right people. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, one of the questions that um, come up uh, revolves around you know, marine sciences and fisheries programs and how to strengthen that in Southeast. Um, it seems like uh, the, the base for a lot of those programs are in Fairbanks, uh, which is a little curious when you look at geographical proximity to water, but um, is, are, are there actions or that, that uh, the region can support to, to really increase that focus here in Southeast? Yeah. I, uh, you know, in part of the closing down of the discussion of merger, we, we added a focus area of how do we increase the presence of fisheries and ocean sciences in Juneau. And I, I spent time uh, looking at, uh, spending time with the College of Fisheries and Ocean Sciences and also with each of the programs in, in Juneau at the Hawk Bay facility on, at the Anderson building. So you have the Anderson building and you have the Lena Point facility and then you have the, the NOAA facility, the Ted Stevens um, Center right next door. The, um, the interest is increasing the presence of fisheries and ocean sciences. It is not about reallocating. Um, not only is the College of Fisheries and Ocean Sciences in Fairbanks, it is in Seward, it is in Kodiak, it is in Anchorage. It is in communities all across the, um, the state. But the, the research core and the research administration is, is, is in Fairbanks. But the college has many faculty at the Lena Point, Point facility uh, working closely with the UAS Southeast faculty. I was, I was very impressed with the number of joint programs going on. There's several students, uh, graduate and PhD students at the Lena Point facility. Yes, they're in, a, in the Research One UAF program, but they're in Juno. My interest is how do we increase the presence of fisheries? Juno has tremendous location advantage, but let's think about it as a growing pie. And what can we do to attract more people um, to that? Even, even if, it's, if it's a summer program or another institution that doesn't have the, the unique location, if it were, that institution would come up, bring some students. What, what we want, I think the, the fisheries program and the marine science program, ecology program, at that Anderson building and the biology program, and their linkage to the, to the master's and PhD programs and their linkage to NOAA, as an undergraduate bubble, that, that can attract so many people um, around the region, but also out of state because of, of the place. And Fairbanks emphasis is much more in the master's than PhD. And so how can we build this court here? But how can we also, uh, we had a, a brief conversation, not a brief conversation, but I had a conversation with, with C Alaska. You know, there, there is, there's broader interest in how do we get people thinking about the sustainable fisheries, mariculture, how, how do we push that out into the community? How do we get people coming out of high school thinking, that's what I want to do, and I want to do it for the place I love. And that's how do we create the buzz? And I think we, we have the perfect opportunity at Southeast to create the buzz, but we can grow the pie. And, I, and that's how I want to look at it. Well, you, you said the buzzword, the mariculture, and all of a sudden things start getting exciting around here, um, yeah. uh, including, including my virtual background. Um, yeah. Because that is uh, something that is. Um, evolving in the region and something that's going to be more of a priority for mm -hmm. Southeast Conference going forward. And one of the things we'd like to see facilitated is, uh, you know, an increase. So 
I, I appreciate the way you framed that answer and that we're not looking to take away something from another place, but we're looking to grow and enhance mm -hmm. uh, those programs and create partnerships that um, can enable economic development and educational opportunities, um, especially with um, you know the, the Catch Camp facility that we saw um, you know two years ago and visited. It was um, a lot of opportunity. Uh, Chancellor, do you have a comment uh, to add on that as well? Yeah, so I just had a conversation this morning with Paul Kraft, our director in Sitka, and he is working actively to develop aquaculture and mariculture down at our Sitka campus. And I think there's great opportunity there. Our fish tech program is down there, and we've already, we're already offering a few classes, and I've really tasked him with really growing those programs um, in Sitka, because I just think there's great opportunity to do that. Thank you, and I think we'll want to reach out and follow up with uh, them as we have our task force and committee work. We'll make sure that we get the right people from the university system included on that as well. Um, the next question that comes in is uh, regarding federal uh, assistance and um, you know COVID relief. Uh, Congress is is contemplating another round. Um, do you have any insights, or have you provided input on what is the most meaningful type of assistance that could come to the university system and let us know, you know, what is the most effective type of aid that we can help support and advocate for as well. Well, there's two, uh, uh, two pieces of that question. One on the, on aid specific to universities. Um, right now there's a maintenance of effort requirement and with the cuts the university has received, we would be ineligible. So we're working with the delegation to try to get that maintenance of effort requirement off, you know, out of the federal rule as it comes across. And, you know, it would be beneficial um, and it'll help us, you know, we, our auxiliary operations, our dorm food service, uh, for Anchorage and Fairbanks parking systems. Those, those standalone business units, those are, we're, we're seeing uh, real reductions. Of course, our enrollment, we saw a reduction there in um, not, as, not as bad as we anticipated it was gonna be, but still we, we have less enrollment. And um, so, but the relief thus far, has been uh, in some ways very not not doesn't cover all of the costs but we've covered more costs than we had originally expected uh, when COVID hit so this next relief bill could could support you know could get us out we can't get back to zero there's no way um, but maybe only in the you know 10 to 15 or million range of reductions so we're, we're hopeful for that, but again, that waiver is a, is a big issue. The second piece is, um, so the, the Congress and Senate are really far apart on this unemployment insurance. Uh, I was able to have a, a discussion with Senator Mikowski and talking about the, the same conversation I've had with City Borough of Juneau and Anchorage and and Fairbanks that Karen had mentioned that, you know, now is the time for these people who are unemployed to go back to school. Let's, you know, there's not jobs available. Convince people to invest in themselves, get retraining now while we're in a pause of the economy. So when the jobs do come back, they can get the best job. I had that conversation with Senator Murkowski and she, uh, she was like, maybe that's something that can help us bridge this gap between, the Congre between Congress and Senate. So that um, investing in education, again, we're gonna, we're gonna take care of people one way or the other. What, why don't we take care of them in a way that they can take care of themselves for the long run? Um, and so that kind of two pieces, so anything you can do on those two pieces um, when you are having conversations, certainly appreciate it, and and really appreciate how quickly uh, Juno um, started 
looking deeply into this idea of helping the people who are unemployed in Juneau uh, go back and get retrained. That was their, their uptake on that concept was just really fast and impressive. Thank you. Great. Thanks. And, and if you could have, uh, maybe have staff uh, send us uh, some, uh, some more information on that, we can um, help support that in, in our conversations and our members' um, efforts as well. So be happy to, to, to do that. Um, so we've got about five minutes left. I just want to give you each an opportunity to just kind of sum up uh, any other ways that uh, our, our organization individually or collectively that we can continue to show our support for uh, the university that we, uh, we so dearly appreciate uh, and, and love and uh, just um, tell, us, tell us how we can help. Well, there is one more question, Robert, in the um, Q&A. Okay. I hear that the university left a lot of students hanging by dropping classes during this pandemic. So what is the incentive for students to sign up for the University of Alaska? So I'm not familiar that we dropped a lot of classes during the pandemic. We, we, did, we did close classes with low enrollment, which is something that we always do. We need to have um, a, a stable group of students in a class in order to have that class go forward. So if a class only has two or three students, it's just not viable on our part to keep that class going. But as far as uh, closing a lot of classes, I'm not familiar with that. I don't know if you've heard anything differently, Pat, but that's what I know. No, but it, but in terms of uh, final remarks, I would um, you know just encourage in your communications um, communicate that you know, university is seeking stability and it, and that the programs are here. The programs are integrally tied to the community. Um, and, you know, secondly, hold us accountable. You know, and, and when you hear an example of something that is a dissatisfier, let us know what it is. Let, let, us, let us shake it down. And we, we want to be here, but we're here to serve. Um, and, you know, we're, we're going to be smaller, there's no doubt but our focus on programs is, is strong and we are going to be here for these communities. Absolutely you're gonna be here. And I would just add, you can reach out to me anytime. I'm willing to serve, I'm willing to work with all of you um, in, in any way we can. If you have ideas for programs, if you have ideas about collaborations, just reach out to me and, and let's talk because we want to make sure that the University of Alaska Southeast is strong and vital in this Southeast community. So I will say thank you for having me today. I appreciate it. And I really look forward to seeing y'all in person. Well, ditto and thank you both. And uh, we really wish you success at your, uh, your, your challenging uh, times and positions, but anything else that we can do uh, that open communications is two ways. And, we're, we're happy to support the university system as a whole, and especially our crown jewel here in Southeast Alaska. So thank you for joining us today. Thanks. And I'm actually gonna stay on and listen to uh, Admiral Barrett. Excellent. All <laughs> right, well, we'll, uh, we'll let you all fade to black and uh, we will now go to uh, Admiral Barrett who is, is online and just really appreciate him um, uh, finding the time to schedule uh, to, to come in after yesterday's uh, um, uh, schedule up, up, upset. So uh, we always got room for, for one more speaker and uh, Admiral Barrett was gracious enough to uh, be available. And for those of you that don't know him, and I did not know him personally uh, before this work group got started. Um, of course, I heard, heard, of the, uh, heard of the Admiral because he certainly has been around making an impact across the state uh, where um, you know, he spent 35 years in the Coast Guard and uh, you know, commanded operations in, in Alaska and the North Pacific. Uh, so he's no, no stranger to marine transportation. He was also deputy secretary at the uh, U.S. Department of Transportation and the first administrator of the U.S. Pipeline Hazardous Materials Safety Administration, which 
got him. I guess that's where you fell in love with the pipeline company, right, uh, Admiral? Um, yeah, sir. He served. Yeah. Uh, a got me back to Alaska, Robert. Got me yeah. back to Alaska. So um, mo most recently, uh, he retired as president of the Alaska Pipeline Service uh, Company. So, um, you know, his his renown for uh, for high performance culture uh, attracted him to the, the Alaska Marine Highway System because it's only the impossible that's worth doing. And uh, we appreciate the time that he spent in, in leading that effort. And Admiral, uh, our membership is very interested in, in hearing about what the group work group is likely to be recommending. And so I'm gonna fade off the screen and let you uh, give an update. Good morning and thank you for joining us. Oh, Robert, thank you. I'm delighted to be with you. I appreciate the accommodation to, uh, it's a, uh, on a schedule and I know you're probably all tired because I've I looked at your agenda and it's a busy one. It's a good one. It's a strong one. Uh, but I know how I feel at the end of uh, several days of meetings and that tires me out more than a bike ride. And uh, I, uh, I, and I, I have to, I'll have, to, I'll try and uh, be focused if, uh, if, uh, you know, the acting university president, Pat Pitney there um, is listening. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, Pat, if you're still there, I do wish uh, you every success. You've got a tough job. But that university system is critical, just critical uh, to the future of this state. And, uh, and, uh, and so uh, it was certainly in your corner as you try to, uh, to get it in a better space with the challenges you face. So I uh, wish you the best on that. And, and I know you're up to it and capable of it. So delighted to see you willing to take this on. So, so let's talk about the Alaska Marine Highway System and ferries. Uh, a little bit about my background, which, which shapes our thing. So I should preface this. I'm talking today, since we haven't issued our report to the governor yet. Uh, we're close, but we're not there yet. I'm speaking for myself. So what you're getting from me today is my opinion. I don't want to speak for the rest of the entire work group. Um, Robert is one of the, the work group members as well. Um, but I'm not speaking today uh, for anyone other than myself, and certainly not for the administration and, and anything like that. But, but uh, take, take what I'm telling you in that context. Uh, I do tell Robert, I, I'm amazed, he's mentioned in some of my background, but I'm amazed at how many hats he wears uh, successfully. And, and I admire him. I've enjoyed the chance to work with him and, and uh, uh, it's been a pleasure and, and it's been very helpful. So just in terms of my background that I wanted to put, I, my family and I came up to Alaska in 1981. Um, with the Coast Guard, and I have a great affection for, so we've been here, uh, I've lived in Southeast, I've lived in uh, Juneau, our family was there for a total of seven years. I've lived in other places, the service, uh, the highway system serves Kodiak, we lived out there for six years. And I have a great affection for the communities that the system uh, serves, and you know, both from a, a just a, and I've visited many of them over the years, either with the Coast Guard or in some other capacity. But I also have a lot of affection for the people in those communities and the people that run the highway system, quite frankly. Alaska, you know, if you think about it, it's got some very tough weather and water. Um, you've got uh, these huge infrastructure, I mean, huge uh, distances everywhere. System itself is about 3,500 miles. You have some of the worst weather on the planet and you've got very limited infrastructure. So it's always a challenging environment. Uh, the ferry system's been around near past your 50th anniversary. And, uh, and certainly my perspective is, is that uh, we wanna keep it around uh, long into the future. You know, my expression at the pipeline was hashtag 40 more. Well, I think the ferry system's the same way, hashtag, uh, you know, 50 more, if you will. But none, because I think it's important in terms of what a ferry system can offer to coastal communities anywhere. So, so that's kind of uh, out there. Um, but on the other hand, the system in its current form, and, and I think you're, you're feeling it the last uh, two years, is um, uh, it's, it's not performing as anybody would like or desire for a whole variety of reasons and a lot of history. So, uh, so to get it in a more sustainable uh, space, that's kind of our charter, is to reshape the system a lot. There's challenges on cost, there's challenges on reliability, there's challenges on sustainable. You have a fleet. Uh, you know, you're investing when you, you get a vessel in a 30 or 40 year asset. So you got long term capital investments. It's very hard to change them uh, and be agile and adjust to changes in your environment. Uh, the, the one you're dealing with today, obviously, is COVID. Uh, systems doing a very good job, uh, from what I can see, of working that. But it, it's challenging and it, it's imposed additional cost and, 
and challenges. And again, uh, they seem to be working it. I think they do a, a reasonable job of doing what they're doing. But that we're not directly addressing COVID in the work group. I think that's a we're going to have to work through that um, operationally. And the whole state is it's being managed at a state level uh, over the next year or two or three. How fast it, we get out of that is is anyone's guess at this point. But in terms of the work group, you know, the governor asked us to take a look at, uh, at, at, uh, at things that could reshape the ferry system. And uh, in my approach in general, and I think the approach of the work group is, is to kind of, there, there are a lot of reports out there. Uh, uh, you've done a lot of good work in, in Southeast Conference in, uh, in over many years, actually, in, in looking at the system, coming up with ideas to change how it operates. A lot of good data in there, two major studies at least. There are studies that predate your work that, uh, that I looked at go way, way back, certainly as early as the early 1980s. And, and, and there have been a bunch of ideas, uh, some of them good, uh, maybe some I'd agree with, some not, but really not much has been implemented, not much has changed. Uh, I also want to talk a, a little bit about, and the state, the third thing is the state's, you know, um, you know, fiscal situation, again, it's nothing that this work group's going to solve, but it's a context that that's kind of, uh, that the state is going to have to address and solve over the next, uh, in the short term, uh, but over the long term as well. And that, that's a challenging role, but that's a context in which the ferry system is going to operate, but it infuses kind of where we are, if you will. And, uh, uh, you, if you look at um, uh, you, how we approach the job, um, we had a charter from the governor, you know, and he told us to look specifically at a study done by Northern Economics, um, and they made recommendations about ways to reduce the cost of operating the system. And we've gone through that, and, and we will pick up some of the recommendations in that study and recommend them forward. Um, we will, um, but we looked a lot more broadly. We looked at your reports. We looked at some of the other reports. Uh, we've had, uh, all our meetings are public, but we tried, made an effort to talk to the people that run the system, uh, to commercial providers, uh, to uh, uh, the municipal league, to, uh, to other people who are effectively stakeholders uh, in this system. And, uh, and that shaped where we're going. But broadly, if you want uh, my impression again, what's lacking and has been lacking uh, are two things fundamentally, and and that is there's not a real term, a long term strategy or work plan that has that people have agreed to that that positions the system forward for success. And if you think about how planning, long term planning is done. Uh, generally, if, and I'm, there's lots, you've got a lot of consultants can sell you a lot of ways to do this, but, but I'm not seeing a strategic long-term view that would allow the system to succeed better in the future. And, uh, and so we're, that's a context for us. And is one of the things we tried to pull into our discussions is what, what do we need to do? Your fleet plan, your current fleet does not match your service demands. It's certainly old, that's an issue but it's not designed to match the demands for service you have, and it doesn't operate in a way that optimizes what the current fleet can provide. A lot of reasons for that, uh, but I'm gonna come back to that. The, the, um, the cost of the system is, um, and we're talking uh, the state cost primarily, there are federal dollars come in, but there, there's two fundamental elements of that. It's how much does the state have to contribute to run the system. Uh, this fiscal year, it's about uh, 54 plus uh, million dollars. And, and that, I don't know how the COVID will factor into you know, that and next year and stuff. And, uh, but it used to be a lot more. It used to be 100 uh, plus million. And it's, it's steadily come down, but um, that's where you are. And what's the future look like and how, how sustainable. But I, you know, and this is my sense that, um, and sustainable, the numbers it will take from that state GA fund to sustain the system um, that may have been tolerable 10 years ago are, are not going to be um, tolerable or accepted going forward. So I think the strategy, uh, if you will, is to get the system to be as efficient as it can. And, and that means changes in, in a number of categories. And it uh, doesn't mean that it doesn't operate. It means that it operates more efficiently. One of the components of that, a major component uh, that I know the work group has looked at, is, 
is, you know, the Fairbanks, how much fair system services or charges for its services, you know, what, and, and, and what's the modeling behind that? How are those services modeled against demand and opportunity? You know, or should prices be up or down? Should, uh, you know, uh, some routes are, are closer to, to neutral on that. A business would think about that as what you would call an efficiency ratio. So it's not, it's not everything, right, in terms of this system, but it's an indicator for a business if it, uh, you know, if, if to, make, uh, to make a dollar, basically, how much do you have to spend? If you spend 80 cents to make a dollar, then your, your uh, operating profit margin, uh, even, you know, at least before taxes, is, is that 20 cents in there. So in the ferry system, it's the, what's the revenue that you can generate in and how does that compare to the cost, the operating cost of the system? And I'm not talking most systems, most business, CapEx, capital expense, operating expense. So we're really looking, we're focused uh, on, on both of those, but a lot of the CapEx fund is supported by federal dollars. So, but, but again, how, how do you tell if the system is as efficient as it can be? Um, I, I think everybody on the work group and everybody that I've talked to understands there's a public service public uh, value component to the system. It affects uh, access from communities um, to other communities and to the road system. It affects the quality of life in those customs. There's uh, cultural values. There's uh, health and safety values. There's quality of life issues. So that's a given. And, and uh, I think that uh, we're sensitive to, and we heard a lot of that uh, from people that talked to us. So, so quickly in terms of what we heard, um, uh, broadly, right, the last couple of years have been horrible, uh, but the system is not reliable and the schedules are not predictable. So one of our goals as a group is to recommend actions that would, over the long term, if they're implemented, have the system operate more, reliable, more reliably and with more predictability. Okay, so that's one major goal. That's important to the people who depend on the system. And then the second uh, thing that we heard is, you know, if you're making adjustments, if, if cost is going to be a challenge, uh, you know, factor in um, that reliability predictability issue that, that a number of the folks that we heard from said, well, they could tolerate perhaps a little uh, or some less service, service frequency, that type of stuff, if it was more dependable, if it was more reliable. So, so that's kind of one, one objective we have. Uh, the second one is the whole cost thing. Our, and this is, um, and I would tell you honestly, this is my perspective. People always argue, and, and fairly, right? Uh, different perspectives on that. I don't diminish it. Um, uh, about, you know, what's the, how much subsidy are we going to put in this year? Is it 50 million? Is it 40 million? Is it 80 million? Uh, and they argue about that number. And I think that argument, um, I mean, it's a fair one. I don't mean that but it overlooks a fundamental opportunity. And that is the underlying organization is, are you assuming that that organization is operating just like any business as efficiently as it can be? And by that, I mean, uh, it's an effective organization in meeting all those objectives that we want, but it's also as efficient as you can make it. And, uh, and so that's one of our goals is to look at that. And, I, and that's one of the spaces we're looking at. Um, it's, uh, we don't control the state budget, uh, but, but, and I think there are opportunities there to have the system run um, more efficiently if we do some things. So we will recommend a number of changes, some of which have come from other reports, some of which are our own ideas uh, that um, we think could make the system um, more efficient. And I think there are a number of steps that can be taken the service level issue will always come up. I'm trying to look at what kind of criteria could inform those kind of decisions. But um, there are other things that um, don't affect that as dramatically uh, that we're looking at. Uh, we're looking at the personnel cost structure and maybe the vessel manning and the overtime and all that. And I, I don't, uh, we've had, we have a, a, a union rep on, on the board. And they do a great job, by the way, of uh, running the system safely. And all the times I've heard, um, okay, comments we've got, I've never heard a safety concern come up. But nonetheless, these, uh, the, the agree, so, and there's regulations that require certain things, particularly on passenger vessels. But, but is there room to 
have the system operate more flexibly um, if we got some changes in agreements that we've already made uh, over many years um, with, with the people that operate the system. And, it, and they, you need skilled talent. A lot of them need licenses. So I don't mean that, uh, no way. I'm always sensitive to who does the real work. But but I think there are things that we could do, and I don't mean things you can impose. I think you things that um, could be negotiated. That's how you have to do it. You have to reach an agreement um, that would improve uh, the cost. And and if we do things like that successfully, um, then uh, then you're able to uh, not do things that are much more. Um, challenging to the people that want the service, such as take vessels out of service or reduce service levels uh, in, in, a, in a harsher way or eliminate communities. So we want to take all those other things up front that would, would cut uh, the, the, uh, the, serve, the, uh, the cost of operation. And, I, and I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples, but uh, you know, you have vessels that the system's over capacity right now with all vessels, right? We know that. And uh, uh, are, could we run some of the mainline vessels more like day boats? You've got fatigue restrictions on, on what you can do with crews. They call them day boats, 12, 14 hour uh, crew time. Well, if you've got even a large vessel, and I'll give you, an, I'm making, you know, I, I don't assume this will be an answer, but if you took the uh, uh, Tustanema, it's an ocean class vessel, uh, carries passengers. Um, could you use that vessel sometimes uh, not carrying passengers or not carrying as many passengers and reduce the crew size and use it as more of a day boat where the crew would not be overnight on the vessel. Those type of things would give the system more flexibility. So, so that's kind of, but, but we'll come up, we'll, how does that shake out? It's going to have to be the organization understanding what you can do to get more flexibility and what you can do uh, to, uh, to leverage the assets you have more effectively. So that, but it's, it, you gotta have a strategy approach on that and we'll try and do that. Change is hard, like I, uh, I've said that repeatedly and um, I just wanna close up with, with uh, one or two thoughts and, uh, and, and Robert, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions you have or, or address any other issues you have. Um, but uh, the recommendations we make will be in the context of a longer term, a long-term strategy. Uh, but but I think we need to think better about that. And um, so I want to say two things. Can we get to a place where the system can run more effectively? And, and, and how do you adjust to changes? Um, how we think about that is not um, optimal from my point of view. There's a design started for the, um, notionally, for a replacement vessel for the Tustanema. Even the way you describe it, that's an old vessel, right? Um, the current one, the trusty Tusty. I rode that many times in and out of Kodiak. I know some of the skippers, uh, one or two of them were ex-Coast Guard. Um, how is the strategy to replace the Tustanema the way we use it now? Um, I'm not sure that's long range thinking. This is gonna, whatever, if you bring in another, if, and it, you're talking a quarter of a billion dollars to build a replacement, even if the feds pay for a lot of it. Is, is the idea that we're going to design that vessel to do what the current vessel does. I don't think that's prudent. There's lots of issues around that, but how does that fit into how the system is going to operate, not in five years, but in 10 years or in 20? Things may change, but you've got to lay that down. And the example that, um, I, I, and I pass this back, I don't, I'm not a decision authority, but one of the issues is is your replacement vessel gonna be able to sail into Prince Rupert? You have to meet safety of life at sea requirements, SOLAS requirements um, in order to do that. Canada has a different set of strictures than the United States. If you don't meet those requirements, um, you're not ever going into any Canadian port. So is this, build, is this vessel you're building, do you in, are you willing to accept that the fact that that vessel, uh, or, or, or should you plan to have that vessel able to go to Prince Rupert or any Canadian port or not? And, and what's the long-term vision for the fleet? And there's a cost to building those things in. There's an enormous cost if you decide 10 years after you got the boat, you wanna retrofit it to meet that requirement. But it's that long-term planning. Uh, the last thought, we'll, we'll try and inform this with a little history. 
is this possible to do all these things and do them smart? Um, I think it is, and your own history suggests it is. If you look at the first uh, 10 years of the system, 20 years of the system, really, um, but early in its years, the system uh, as a whole was pretty close to uh, operating that efficiency ratio almost at a neutral point. Today, every route loses money. But, but back then, it was pretty close to, it wasn't exactly zero, but the subsidy level was much less. And what was going on is people were riding the ferries. The airfares were very high. Uh, the connection to the road system, the, you know, the fun of riding ferry vessels. All those things shaped a huge demand thing. And the system reacted by lengthening vessels, stretching them out, adding capacity to each man. Well, times changed. The cruise industry came in. So a lot of people that used to run up on the highway, they're getting on cruise ships now. They want a different experience coming up to Alaska. Airfares and airfare and air service reliability improved dramatically. So a lot more people are flying a lot more. You can look, I lived in Juneau, you live, many of you live there. Um, Alaska Airlines can land in there and pretty close to zero visibility right now. They did not used to be the case, right? It's more reliable and changes in the airline industry, you know, the low cost carriers have forced fares to come down. But the system never adjusted to that change in environment because they weren't taking, you know, a, they weren't, they didn't have a function in place to do that kind of long-term planning and, and make adjustments. And, uh, uh, and I think we need to get into that space, but are some of these things achievable? Uh, that's it. Robert, I, I, you asked for 20 minutes, I gave it, I think, um, I, the one thing I didn't talk to was the governance. That was one of your recommendations. I'm happy to talk to it or shut up if you need to move on to other stuff. Oh, we, we just have a, a couple minutes for, for questions. And um, if the answers are quick, we'll throw, keep throwing questions at you. Uh, but the first one that came in was about governance uh, structure. Will there be a recommendation as to governance? Um, just the first one. So I, I, there will be, right? It's obviously a challenge issue. Uh, your reports have addressed that in depth uh, with recommendations to move to like a state corporation. Um, so we will address that issue. Um, I'm speaking for myself now and, and I want to preempt exactly what, what we'll say or what the group, you know, will, will sign. But I see a problem moving to that model quickly, right? Um, you know, the the systems are, uh, I mean, the, the, the decisions are influenced heavily by political process, they will always be. Uh, I don't think putting that kind of structure in place would avoid that because you've got communities that want certain things, legislatures that, that want to obviously support their constituents. At a state level, um, you know, it's, it, it gets into the budget, um, but the, um, I don't see a way to eliminate the need to go to the legislature and ask for that, that um, uh, that state support, that GA support for a number of years to come. And so even if you were able to get, you know, the railroad is an example. Um, uh, they've got funding sources. They don't have to come in and ask for money. As long as you're going to have to come in and ask for money, I don't think that adds a lot uh, right now. So we'll recommend something short of that. Uh, there are some things out there that uh, you've got the MTAB group. You've got how the, fundamentally, this is me. I think and public input is always good, so you always want that, but you need a, um, a um, more of a marine operations board, something function with more um, operating skills, more management skills that can help the organization succeed. So, so I would structure um, either that advisory council or some other group to provide more functional advice about the things the system actually does at a, at a operational or business level. But that's, so I think uh, personally, that model I think is still out there. Ferry systems, we looked at a lot of systems, they operate all, all the way from kind of what Alaska does, a state organization, all the way over to an independent corporation. And, and I think we'll be somewhere in between there in terms of our recommendations. But, um, but I don't think you can get to that long-term goal as long as you have to come in and ask for money. And as long as you're in the middle of service to Alaskan communities that affect the elected representatives of their constituents. So um, quick, are you trying to craft your recommendations so that they can be done by executive order 
or is this going to have to go through the legislature that could take many years to resolve? Yeah, so we will try and craft things that can be implemented immediately or short term in the next one, two, three years. Um, we, and if we think a legislative change is, uh, is appropriate, and say in this area or some legislative change, we'll recommend it. But we want to get, uh, it, um, honestly, Robert, it's not either or, we'll probably do both. We'll say these are things you can do and we'll encourage them to do them promptly uh, so that we're not in the reactive mode and, you, and, and not, you know, the do you, you want to get the dogs, uh, the reliability and the, all that kind of stuff in a better place. So we'll recommend things that can be done quickly uh, by, not even by executive order, but by the, uh, the AMHS, by the Department of Transportation, and obviously um, by, by the governor. And, uh, but uh, I think you will also say some things about legislative changes we think might help. Okay, um, and I'm not sure there's a quick answer to this one, but we'll give it a try. I'll come and combine two questions into one, speaking to um, the long-term fiscal certainty and vessel maintenance. Uh, how do we avoid the um, situation we found ourselves in this spring with every yep. single ferry tied up? Yeah, so what, what, and this is my opinion again, and we talked extensively to the people that work the ferry system. They're working hard, you're dealing with old ships. Um, what I would, uh, will encourage them to focus more on the maintenance planning and so that there are fewer surprises. And uh, that's, it's not always gonna be perfect, uh, but as an operator, there are too many instances where, and, and we're not seeing the metrics that would help you do that. Uh, and maybe they're there and we're just not seeing them, but how many unscheduled yard days have you put into the system? Can you drive that down? Um, uh, is and, and by vessel, you know, where, where is the gap? And then, but the maintenance planning, there are ways to do that, um, that I think are better, but it requires a focus and, uh, and, and some asset directed to that. So, so that's one of the things uh, we'll, uh, we'll so, talk um, about. Final question that we're not gonna have time to get to the others, but um, um, just could you characterize the discussion about uh, road links that may not yet exist and uh, specifically the Cascade Point Ferry Terminal which has been uh, discussed this week at Southeast Conference. Yeah so there are different views in the in the uh, group about the viability of it. Um, I was down and you know, I actually drove out to it. Uh, the advantage of that um, and you you know you you came up with a you know a, an option there but taking advantage of road systems if they're in the near term uh, can aid the system. So Cascade uh, uh, would, uh, if you were running from there, allow the, um, uh, the ferries to operate with, with more day boats, more, uh, as opposed to more overnight crewing. Your two new boats, by the way, um, don't have accommodation. So you, you design two vessels that if you wanna have, uh, continue the long runs uh, with those boats, you're gonna have to add crew quarters and all the OPEX tail that goes with su sustaining those overnight crews. So um, I think there's an advantage to that. There are different views in the, in the um, work group on that. And I'm not a, you know, I'm not a fun of wisdom, but we'll, we'll say something about that. And, and I, you may see a couple of, a member or two that have a different view and we'll certainly reflect that in the report. But I think it's, um, it, how speculative is it? One of the advantages of being in the Department uh, of Transportation is the ability to sync up other infrastructure issues with ferry operations. From a ferry operation point of view, having that terminal road, um, you know, at fixing the road for a couple of miles there, and, and there may be other benefits to that, and I'm not even touching that. From an operating ferry point of view, there would be advantages to that. All right, well, thank you again for taking the time uh, to address the, the membership here and give an update on where that work is. I know um, having sat through the many hours of meetings with you, <laughs> I also know that you put double that into um, the off meeting times, uh, preparing and, and writing stuff up. So thank you. So, uh, so I, I wish you well with your conference. Uh, uh, I, I don't underestimate the value of it. Your reports have been very helpful. And, uh, I, you know, I'm... I, I'm not afraid of change, and but I'm an optimist. I appreciate and understand the value of the system, and we'll try and make changes that, uh, you know, that make it better for the future. And I think that's everybody's goal here. Uh, but but some of the changes will be challenging, and that's kind of the world we're in. All right. Well, thank you for the chance again. And, all right. We well, appreciate it. Uh, 
All right, so um, that actually concludes the presentations of our annual meeting, and now we get to go into the membership meeting, which um, I will turn over to our president. Now, the nice, nice thing about this is that we once again get to see everybody. Um, and I think uh, it'll take a couple minutes to get everyone elevated, but everyone's going to get an invite that you click on that uh, will elevate you to panel status and uh, give you the opportunity to turn on your video and turn on your microphone. Uh, we would like you to start off by turning on your video and turning off your microphone unless you're speaking so that you don't hear the sirens in the background like uh, you just heard a minute ago. That was me. Uh, and uh, we're gonna get a chance to see each other, chat in the chat box, and then um, conduct the necessary business that we have to do each year at annual meeting. And then uh, we'll keep it live after that if anyone wants to uh, engage as well. So uh, we'll go ahead and, and get started. Mr. President, um, I, it's all yours. All right, so we'll go ahead and call the meeting to order. It's 1130. Um, the, uh, so it's, yeah, so thanks everybody for turning the, on your screens. It is nice to see everybody's faces here. It looks like the, uh, just getting right down to business on the, on the meeting here, we have the approval of the minutes from the, from the 2019 annual meeting. And uh, so let's see. Well, I guess the hard part here is I can't tell whether or not we have our full quorum on for the board, right? I gotta look through. Let's definitely see if we can get some board member cameras on. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five. We gave Rory time to comb his hair, but uh, here he is. So let's see here. You're only seeing six, right? Do we have enough to, uh, there we go. We got enough on here, right? So is there a motion to approve the minutes from the 2019 meeting? I will make the motion to approve the minutes of the 2019 annual meeting. Second, I'll second. this is Casey. The, uh, all right, so we have a motion by Mayor Hill and a second. I'm gonna give the race to Casey on that one. So uh, <laughs> all in favor of approving the minutes, please signify by saying aye. Or we wildly. All opposed. Signify <laughs> yeah. by say nay. And looks like I'm not gonna get any of those. So we do have the minutes approved and looks like we're gonna move straight into the treasurer's report. So that's up to you, Rory. Uh, remarkably our finances, uh, it's been a good year and uh, huge credit to our executive director. Um, He's really, really done a great job for uh, the board. He's made the board's life very easy. So not he, he's obviously done a great job for the region and he's obviously done a great job for the citizens of Southeast, uh, but our executive director uh, has done a fantastic uh, job uh, for the board. So I, I heartily thank Robert for uh, going out and uh, pursuing uh, other grant money. We got a uh, one-time uh, US uh, Economic De Development Authority grants uh, that helps our regional authority, our regional uh, efforts. Uh, it helps our 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 budget. Um, and lets us keep doing what we're doing, keeping us all together. Um, I just think that uh, you know that. Also, I want to talk about annual meeting. So annual meeting, um, I think from a financial perspective, has gone very well. As, uh, also. Uh, so it hasn't cost us a lot of money. I don't think we've established uh, the relationships that we can do in person, uh, but financially, um, the annual meeting has been just fine for us. It didn't cost a lot of money, and, and I think it's been run really well, and uh, I think we've made the best of a difficult situation. Uh, so uh, when I think back to when I came on the board, I'm not even sure when that was, several years ago, four years maybe, um, we were in tough financial times. 
uh, we were we were in the red. Uh, we were spending in excess of our revenues. Uh, it was very very difficult. Uh, we made some hard uh, hard decisions, um, and and uh, I think Robert has um, maintained the ship. So I, I heartily thank the executive director uh, for moving the organization and the people of Southeast Alaska forward, um, and uh, doing it in a way uh, that that was budgetarily possible. So uh, we're in good shape, and uh, Robert gets the lion's share, if not all that credit. Yeah, thanks, Murray. And, uh, you know, one thing I'll add to that is it, 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 there has been a lot of, I, I've just greatly appreciated really all the staff's work on that. Um, you know, Stephanie came in and, and uh, did a lot of, we, there was a lot of work to go in when, uh, to kind of clean things up and turn things around. And, and I know and Milani's done just a tremendous amount of work, particularly on the on the EDA uh, scope of work too, which has been a, a piece of that as well. So um, lots of, lots of uh, credit to go around on that for sure. So thank you all. Um, so next up on the agenda, I get to uh, hand um, the imaginary gavel to, uh, to Marco Shear, who will be stepping in as president of the board. So Marcos, I think the meeting is yours from, from this point on. Well, um, you know, I thank you very much for the for that, and I thank you, uh, Alec, for all of the work that you have done over the uh, the last years, and uh, not just uh, not just in your capably holding the gavel and keeping uh, keeping this all running so smoothly, but uh, but also all of the work that you with Rory and uh, uh, and Robert and uh, uh, and have done to you know kind of get the financial picture back online it really is uh, um, I just want want to make sure to express uh, our appreciation to you for that um, and uh, uh, we want to thank you for your service on the board and your and even though you won't be uh, leaving us uh, just yet uh, you, uh, we just we, we want to make sure that, that we have extended to you the, the, the thanks for the work that you've done and uh, I believe there are, uh, uh, Robert, is there, uh, is, is there a, a recognition of? Uh, 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 and, and those oysters behind him, there's, there's supposed to be a, a pearl of a plaque that, um, uh, okay, get a little closer to your face um, so your camera doesn't, uh, oh, there, there we go. No, All right, so are, uh, that uh, is our, our, our plaque of appreciation for his dedicated service as president of Southeast Conference, presented by the board and members of Southeast Conference uh, today. So at our virtual, and this one has the word COVID in it as well, because it is a historic uh, and the event that as his grandkids look at the uh, plaque on the wall and say, what's that mean, dad? Uh, hopefully they won't know. <laughs> With any luck, yeah. But th thanks for the plaque. The, uh, uh, I heard I was supposed to pretend that someone was handing it to me because ALMP is, is pretty strict about who gets into the building, and so no one's allowed in my office. And uh, so I tried to I tried to pretend that someone was physically giving it to me there at least. <laughs> it, it looked great to us. And, uh, oh, good, good. <laughs> we're not, uh, we're so. Well, thank you. Yes, and thank you. Another example of how uh, COVID has made even the simplest things more complicated. Um, well, we would have preferred certainly to give that to you in purpose, uh, in person, and and everyone to you know, give you a big round of applause and, and uh, probably buy you a cocktail, but uh, we'll have to reserve that for next year's annual meeting in Haynes. Uh, we'll get to that in a little, little bit here. Um, so uh, the next thing on the agenda is to, uh, is to uh, announce the uh, uh, prevailing party uh, and for the new, for the board seats. Uh, we had two, uh, uh, two ballots for uh, for do, for the uh, different districts and um, do we have those counts ready? Do we, we know what to do on the uh, uh, yes? Election? So um, both uh, uh, Caitlin and Zach uh, were voted in for the two non for the two private northern seats. And then um, we had three incumbents that 
ran for the two at-large seats, and the highest vote getters there were uh, were Casey and Dennis Watson. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, and uh, and uh, to the new board members, uh, we want to welcome you. Uh, uh, to uh, to the board, we really appreciate you. Uh, uh, you're taking the time and volunteering to participate, and uh, in the in the work that uh, that we we think is uh, very meaningful work. And uh, if you uh, if you have if you'd like to say a couple of words, I think uh, that would be appropriate. And now is a good time to do that. Um, no, so there uh, doesn't appear to be a. Uh, want to talk about that, but uh, Enrich, uh, if you are on, I don't see you. Uh, I just want to thank you very much uh, for your uh, for putting your name forward uh, on the uh, on this. I know that uh, you have been a great supporter of Southeast Conference and you've participated in committees and in various ways for for many many years. And we would uh, strongly encourage you to please uh, put your name in again uh, uh, next year. Um, we really would, uh, uh, we really appreciate your participation and, uh, and thank you for that. Um, so uh, welcome uh, to the, uh, the new board members uh, uh, that we have. Uh, and then Casey and Dennis, uh, Dennis I know is not online. He is, uh, uh, I think he's uh, uh, got his boat on the grid or something. Uh, and Casey, uh, uh, Welcome, welcome back. I uh, also want to give a special shout out. I heard that uh, uh, they, they uh, roped you into doing the uh, uh, the uh, raise the paddle auction yesterday, and you absolutely crushed it. Uh, so uh, just uh, so thank you very much. Uh, we'll give you a chance to do that again, and that pretty much means that I don't have to do uh, uh, charity auctions anymore. I don't. I don't think that that's what that means. Uh, uh, that's what I interpreted. That uh, uh, no, uh, I've been succeeded <laughs> by somebody vastly superior, and it's got to go to the most capable person. Definitely not. Um, but I do want to thank everybody. Just while I have everyone here for um, participating yesterday, excuse me, and raise the paddle. We ended up getting about uh, forty-seven hundred dollars. Um, just in your participation, which is amazing. And all that money goes back to students um, in Southeast Alaska, goes back to talent acquisition in Southeast Alaska and keeping people, um, keeping your talent where they're from. So uh, thank you guys for participating and being a part of it. And don't forget the silent auction is still on, right? That's right. And as I understand the silent auction, if that's correct, if my recollection serves, and it's always suspect, uh, that it, it will remain active until 8 p.m. tonight. Is that right? That is uh, correct. Oh, very That's good. Right. And I have heard that there uh, have been some ties added to that. So, uh, so there, okay, there are two ties added. So, uh, so be sure to fit on those as well. Oh, I guess I will be uh, destined to wear ties for a long time, or at least until uh, Senator Keel pays off his uh, his tie indebtedness to the to the scholarship uh, account. Uh, you know, just to, uh, I didn't mention it at the time, but I but I have uh, lots of ties that I'm not using as much anymore. I may have twenty or thirty. Um, you know, uh, just tell me the color color and style, and uh, <laughs> we'll load that scholarship fund right up. I've definitely got at least one from each of our team members here, so. <laughs> yes, Miss Hill. I just wanted to uh, say that you need to bid on those two ties that are on there. I'm bidding on them because I don't think there's any place in Haynes to buy a tie for Robert. And you know he's going to get a tie from me. You'll be, you'll be, tie, you'll be set with ties for the rest of your days, Robert. I think so. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, that's that's terrific. Uh, um, uh, and oh, and I uh, just before we move on to the other official business uh, of the uh, election of the first VP and the second VP, I just wanted to give a a, a shout out to uh, uh, Sonia and uh, and her new her new assistant. Well, the, the newest Southeast Conference member, right, Sonia? Newest Southeast Conference member. Yeah, yes, it's so good to see all you guys. I'm glad he got to attend his first Southeast Conference. <laughs> he's, well, he's doing great. Yeah. 
And, and Mr. President, um, that, that can lead to any number of things. I can remember Caitlin, uh, one of her first annual meetings, and just that uh, situation, bringing her, her little one in, and now uh, I think he's two years old, I think. Uh, it's been two or three. I'm not sure, Caitlin, when that exactly was, but you had the, the youngest member in attendance at that time. I actually, I have my nine month old with me here at my office as well this year. <laughs> well, everyone's welcome. Um, well, uh, so thank you, a uh, little, um, little digression there, but I wanted to, uh, the next thing I think we, we need to do on the official business uh, slate on the agenda is, uh, uh, is elevate uh, uh, the a person to the uh, uh, the first vice president position, uh, Lisa. I believe that you are uh, uh, you are the person uh, that will be elevated to first vice president. Uh, uh, congratulations! Uh, so we just uh, it, we need a, a motion from the board and a second to uh, to elevate uh, uh, Lisa to the first vice president position. I'll make that motion. This is Casey. I'll okay. second. I have a second. And uh, Mr. President, just just a point of order. Um, actually, that, that the motions and uh, vote can come from the entire membership. Uh, the board's fine as well, but just so the membership knows, they can they can chime in and say aye or um, or nominate someone as well. Oh, very good. I, uh, I apologize for that. Uh, and that thank you. Uh, I guess that would be Robert's rules of order. <laughs> you get to look forward to this for a whole year, Bryce. <laughs> He couldn't be more excited. All right. Uh, so yes, we have so we have a motion pending. Uh, we have a first and a second. Uh, uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any any opposition? Aye. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> only only, only one, one opposed to it. Uh, all right. So the motion. It sounds like the motion carries. Uh, uh, congratulations, Lisa. And uh, that's wonderful. Uh, and now we need uh, we need a motion for a uh, uh, for a second vice president. Uh, Mr. President, I have a motion. This is Rory. Yes, uh, Rory. Uh, I'd like to uh, nominate the assistant manager from Alaska's first uh, city, Lacey Simpson. Now well, we have a we have a motion. Do I have a second for that nomination? Second. So Casey Hostetler has has a, a second on that. I, uh, um, and we have, uh, any other nominations for second vice president? Any discussion? I'll call, I'll call the vote. Uh, all in favor of, uh, uh, of appointing Lacey Simpson as the, uh, second vice president, please say aye. 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 Uh, any, any one opposed? Uh, hearing none. Congratulations, Lacey. You are uh, you are the new uh, uh, second vice president for the upcoming year. Thanks, friends. Appreciate it. You going to give a speech? <laughs> that was it, Mark. All right. Fair enough. All right. Very good. Uh, so uh, we've we've taken care of that. We do have uh, um, uh, we do have some other official business that we need to attend to. Uh, as we are abundantly aware, due to COVID, we were not able to uh, hold this annual meeting in person in Haines like we all would have liked to. Uh, so uh, uh, we would, I would ask uh, uh, to uh, uh, I would ask for a motion uh, to have the annual meeting, and this is, this goes out to all of the members as well um, to have the uh, uh, the next annual meeting subject to COVID, I suppose, uh, in Haines in uh, 2021. And then the we had already um, we had already voted to have the the twenty the next meeting the following meeting held in Wrangell, uh, which would now be in twenty twenty two. So we'd have a, a motion to uh, basically move those two meetings, uh, 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 move them back a year, to have them in the in the following year. So that would be Haynes in twenty twenty one and Wrangell in twenty twenty two. I'd like to make that motion. This is Casey. So Casey made the motion to move those meetings respectively. I'll, I'll second. second. This is Lacey. Lacey has a second. Thank you. Uh, any discussion? 
Uh, hearing none, I will call the vote. All in favor of the uh, of the pending motion to move uh, the annual meeting to Haynes in 2021 and to Wrangell in 2022, please say aye. 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 And any opposition? Hearing none, the motion carries unanimously. Mark? Uh, yes, ma'am. Pardon me, this is Lacey. I had a quick question for Lisa about Wrangell. Um, I think my understanding was that, that Wrangell was trying to wait until the Sakine was remodeled. Could you give us an update on that? I will have an update shortly. I don't have one right now. Thanks, Lisa. Okay, um, yeah, so that uh, that works. Is that right? We've got that clarified. Any other question? All right, very good. Uh, so uh, next is uh, uh, is uh, member uh, remarks. I invite any members of the uh, of Southeast Conference to uh, make any ask any questions or make any remarks uh, that uh, and um, um, yeah, now I just. Yeah, I think uh, probably there's a raise your hand or or something. Hey, Mark. If we can do that. Any? Yes. Yes, sir. Hey, Mark. Hey, Gary. I love your background, by the way. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to give a kudos to Robert and everybody. This is a, a really good virtual conference. I uh, Probably wasn't going to be a fan of it, but it actually turned out very, very well, and uh, it, was, it was very informative. So, good job, everybody. Yes, and and actually, that uh, I want to make sure that uh, you know, as part of my remarks on this, I just really want to thank uh, not just Robert, uh, but Jessica and Sarah and and uh, and uh, Melani and everyone at the uh, Southeast Conference. Uh, volunteered to help put this together. They spent countless hours making this happen. It, I, I agree. I think it went off very, very well. I think that we had great, uh, uh, we had great guests. Uh, we, we had, uh, uh, you know, the, the, we, I think the conference was just really terrific. Um, it, you know, it's not the same as the opportunity that gives us all to be in the room and create relationships and, uh, um, and talk about uh, uh, some of these things offline, but uh, making the best, of doing the best that we could do at the same meeting. I uh, please, uh, you know, uh, really want to express uh, appreciation to all of the Southeast Conference uh, staff and um, and folks for putting on a great conference. Mark, this is uh, Zach Kirkpatrick. I wasn't quick enough on the draw when you invited me to uh, say a few words a, a moment ago, but I, I do want to say that. Um, you know, thanks for the opportunity to to serve on the board. Um, just keeping it short, you know, I, I love our home, and I'm intrigued and and motivated, but motivated by the the complexities and the you know that are um, political and and geographical complexities we're up against. But I have to say that to sit through a a conference this week that is generally during these times generally um, characterized by optimism that is telling of Southeast Alaska, and um, I know we're all in, in different spaces, um, industry to industry, but uh, it's an optimistic bunch. And uh, thanks uh, for putting on a, a wonderful conference and, and look forward to uh, lending whatever voice I can. Yeah, thank you, Zach. Yeah, I, I agree. I think uh, for all of, uh, all of the challenges, I think there is a tremendous amount of optimism. And I, and I, and I suspect that our conference next year will be, uh, will be the same. And, and we'll be able to reflect back and look at what we've accomplished in the last year and feel pretty darn good about it. So do we have, uh, let's see, uh, other uh, uh, information announcements. The, the one uh, piece of information that uh, uh, for an announcement for the membership is uh, the mid-session summit. summit is currently scheduled for uh, February 9th through 10th, uh, subject to the realities of COVID and our ability to gather and all of the different uh, um, factors, but uh, that is currently the plan and uh, we hope that we can do that. Uh, we know that there's a lot of important business 
uh, and that uh, uh, and that uh, Southeast Conference making its voice known as part of the um, in the session is really uh, important to the uh, to the many enterprises and businesses and communities around Southeast Alaska. Uh, any other uh, uh, Robert? Any of the other announcements that we should be aware of that uh, we should put out to the membership? Yeah. I think uh, that's generally sums it up well. We're going to keep this live in case people want to chat or look at each other a little bit longer and then talk about anything else uh, uh, after you officially conclude. But I just want to say, um, you know, just thank you for the, the, the recognition of the, the hard work that went in behind the scenes by the team. We were meeting, um, you know, for a number of weeks beforehand, but Jessica and Sarah carried the, the brunt of that load. Uh, Melani and Karen uh, Peterson, uh, joined in uh, for the, the practice runs and getting the kinks worked out. And uh, we had a, a special assist from our friends at Spruce Roots um, and as well as um, Nathan from, from ASEP. So there was a lot of behind the scenes to make this go as seamless as it uh, really did go through. And I was really glad. And, and Zach, I appreciate your, your, uh, your recognition of that sense of optimism because um, it, that's one thing that you know, we really try to focus on is the, the positive and interject hope where, um, and vision. And I think that's what a lot of Melani's work is able to, to help us focus on, not just understanding our past and current, but building that path forward for strategic economic development. And that's what we're committed to do. Um, and I think um, during this pandemic, it's been a unique opportunity to network with the communities and the chambers uh, throughout the region to make sure that the economic relief programs that were available got on the street. Uh, I think when the final numbers are in, I think um, Southeast will once again have, uh, I, I told folks, I don't want to get our fair share. I think that would be a disappointment. We're going to make sure we, we get every penny possible. And last I checked, uh, there was over a thousand applications from just the Alaska CARES program um, and not all of the $55 million being requested will be granted, but uh, there's just a, a lot of uh, resources that are coming to help the region that is impacted the most. And we are going to be hiring uh, an economic development, um, you know, disaster recovery specialist. Um, and, um, you know, we'd rather be based in Juneau. It doesn't have to be, but if uh, there are uh, folks that you know that might want to apply for that, uh, just have them get in touch with me and we're going to continue to um, strongly network with with folks here but again thanks everyone and again to the sponsors because that economic stability is what really gives us the ability to help others because we're not focused on ourselves so much so thank you yeah uh, thank you robert that uh, uh that is really true there's a lot going on there's lots of uh uh work and project process um, uh, you know from my perspective just from the, the mayor culture perspective, we're very excited about the things that are going on and lots of different projects that are in, in process. Um, uh, you know, and I, I think that, uh, you know, to reiterate what uh, um, Representative Ortiz said earlier and others uh, said uh, uh, earlier today, there's, it really is a, an opportunity to build something uh, sustainable in, in, in Alaska or in Southeast Alaska. Uh, anything, uh, any other uh, comments from the membership? Uh, please uh, feel free to speak freely. Uh, my, uh, my dog is speaking for uh, freely, apparently. Uh, this Hello, is this is Patricia. Sorry. Go ahead, Hi, Casey. Welcome back to the board. I'm, I'm really glad you're back on there. Um, so I want to speak about the, the theme of the conference was resilience. And, you know, a lot of the presenters really addressed how we go forward, you know, trying to meet that resilience. And some of the uh, presenters act had actual recommendations to the membership. And I think it would be good to, um, you know, bring those forward either through your um, subcommittees or in, in some sort of newsletter that comes out of this um, conference. But uh, I'm really impressed with the caliber of the board and, um, you know, like your president, you're going to be um, highlighting your work in the mariculture. And um, back, back when I, I got on the uh, Southeast Conference, I was involved in the uh, 
high tunnel project and it's taken years, you know, and, I, and I've been successfully doing that, but other people are noticing that and also applying for those sort of um, projects in, in our, you know, rural area. It's, it's, there's benefits to the membership doing these projects that bring um, sustainability to our region. So I, I, I'm really impressed with the mayor culture that's going on. So anyways, that's my remarks. Thank you. So, um, Mr. President, if I might just follow up on uh, uh, our former president uh, of Southeast Conference Board, uh, Patricia Phillips. Uh, it's always good to have her participate and appreciate that. So um, we will certainly do just that. So look at um, getting those recommendations into committee work. And that is just an opportunity to do a shout out for those of you that might not be signed up for committees or want to look at the committee structures. You would like to be on as many as you want. We welcome your participation. And also uh, those videos uh, that we've recorded the sessions and we will have those up. They're very large files. So uh, it's gonna take a few days uh, to, to get up online, but we will have the presentations and these videos up for folks to review and um, stay uh, to, to, to make actionable as we move forward. So I just wanna put that out there. Uh, thank you, Robert. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, we look forward to that. Uh, if you missed anything or want to go back and review any of the materials, it'll be great to be, have that uh, resource available. Um, any other comments from the membership? This is Casey. Um, I just wanted to say thank you all for your confidence and for your votes. Um, it's certainly a pleasure for me to, to serve on the board for Southeast Conference. It's an amazing group of humans and I am uh, looking forward to another three wonderful years with you all. Uh, I'd also like to thank everyone who donated to the silent auction this year. Um, we were kind of a little worried that it wasn't going to be uh, hugely um, embraced and it's been doing really well. And so thank you all for, for donating. Um, thank you, Gary White, for donating yesterday a couple of uh, awesome prints from his new business called the Sitka Art Exchange. You guys should all go check that out. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to say thank you all and, and looking forward to the next few years of service. Yeah, thank you very much for those comments, Casey. And, uh, and we, we're glad to have you here too. Uh, and particularly since you're gonna take over the auction duty, auctioneering duties for me. And that's, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> uh, any, uh, any, other, uh, uh, any other comments from the membership or any of the board members? No, then uh, I think we'll, oh yes, uh, uh, Mayor Hill. You're on mute. Oh, hey, what, what? It wouldn't, there we go. Yeah. I just um, uh, can't let it go by one uh, without uh, whining a little bit about you guys not being here in Haines this week. Um, we've had some actually pretty beautiful weather and um, it would have been a lot of fun to have you here. But this, um, uh, like uh, Gary White said, I wasn't sure I was going to like doing this meeting um, by Zoom, but we're getting pretty used to Zooming our meetings now. And um, I think that our Southeast Conference staff did an amazing job of, job of putting this together. And um, I've gotten comments from some Haynes folks that have been tuning in over the last few days and they feel very much the same and just asked me to share with this body that we're really um, excited to have you coming here next year and we're going to probably start planning because we're a pretty optimistic group and we're going to choose to believe that you'll all get to come to Haynes next year. So um, good conference. Um, I love Southeast Conference. Looking forward to next year and um, looking forward to hosting you in Haines for next year's annual meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Hill. Uh, yes, and we all look forward to coming to Haines and we're, we're very optimistic that we're gonna be there and, uh, and uh, we get to enjoy a, another, uh, another annual meeting in Haines, which, was, which is tremendous. Any other comments, uh, uh, questions, uh, 
anything for the good of the order. Well, hearing none, I uh, I would ask for a, uh, I think we're probably finished and may, may ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved, this is Casey. Casey moves, so we have a second. Second. We have a second from Alec. And uh, well, thank you all very much for attending and participating uh, in uh, Southeast Conference uh, uh, annual meeting for 2020. Uh, you know, despite all of the challenges that 2020 presents, this, this went off swimmingly well and I'm really impressed. Um, and I just, uh, uh, yeah, thank you all. And we'll, uh, um, one thing, uh, we do have a, a, merit, uh, a, a maritime and seafood uh, committee meeting next week, next Monday at 2, 2 p.m. Uh, if you are interested in uh, participating in that, uh, please reach out to uh, Southeast Conference. They can provide the, the Zoom link to that. And, um, uh, and uh, yeah, thank you all very much. Have a great day. Bye, everybody. Are we gonna, you said you're going to leave this up, Robert, really been up for a while and let people yeah. talk if they want to. So I'm going to do that. And I think uh, if the board members can hang on uh, for a minute, too. I think we want to grab a screenshot um, because we always gather for a picture right after annual meeting. So. I'll stay. I'll stay put. Good, good. So uh, Rory, Mayor Weldon is going to be ready for it. <laughs> What's that? I was saying Rory's hair is ready for it. Totally, totally. And I was just calling on his mayor and she, she, she left us, so. Robert, you'll give us a warning before you take the screenshot or is it just gonna be, you know, any moment it could happen? Well, I, I don't know how many, they've taken. they probably took three already, so. Uh. <laughs> More fun when it's random. <laughs> uh. <clears throat> Actually, um, so I'm going to turn my video off. Oh, I stay on. Well, here's it. Okay, so well, I guess you should start smiling about now. Do you feel like you've been shot? Now, do we take one with everyone having their mask on? Oh, no. Okay. Let me join. <laughs> okay, so they've got this. Everybody else can turn your videos back on and, uh, and say, where's her pond? I see his, I see. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> nice, Bryce, perfect. Oh, no, there you go. Try say something for the record so you, we can see you in all your glory. Oof, duh. <laughs> I have I free see, help. I see that you're still recording. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get screenshots later, too. <laughs> this is what I'm bringing to next uh, annual meeting in Haines is uh, dried kelp. And which meal will we serve that for? Uh, you could use it in a number of meals, actually. It's very versatile. All of them. Yeah, all, all of them. They'll be in all, all of the, we'll have, uh, we'll have seaweed in all of the meals next year. And everyone will be healthier, happier, and, uh, uh, and uh, feeling like they've done their part for the Southeast economy. Well, that will certainly lower our catering costs if you uh, supply a ton of that. Yeah. <laughs> and some of us actually like seaweed. <laughs> I do have a ton to supply to you. I... Well, um, maybe uh, Herb Pond can supply something to wash it down with. That's, that, that was a Prince Rupert tradition, sir. It was. Yeah, it's getting harder to take stuff across that damn border. <laughs> Robert, um, I'll need some, um, some dog salmon eggs or some rice and seaweed with the seaweed, um, soy sauce, onions. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put that on the on the menu for sure. <clears throat> we have uh, lots of gardens in Haines, so I'll provide the onions. 
So is, is Mr. Bradford truly online as well, or has he just uh, got his phone up? I have an announcement really quick, if I wouldn't. Uh, is Jessica on? We just got a FNBA, the First National Bank of Alaska. Wendell just donated $250 to the paddle raise. He yeah. said, I'm sorry, I'm a day late. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, Jan, you'll have to ask him how he's going to spend his uh, certificates as well. Um, he was the lucky winner of that uh, draw yesterday during the tourism committee. Casey, thanks for that. That was kind of a fun fun twist to, to put into the committee structure and that panel was uh, really, really uh, good. Well, you know, I'm going to be asking him who he's taking. <laughs> he has four. So <laughs> I told him somewhere warm. You should go somewhere warm. <laughs> like Angoon. <laughs> <laughs> I hear Prince Rupert's I'm going, really I, nice I, this time of year. <laughs> if they'll let you in. So Herb, has uh, Prince Rupert been impacted uh, much by the, the COVID uh, pandemic or what's, what's the street scene look like there? Uh, twofold. So tourism obviously uh, hit badly. Uh, like you, uh, no cruise ships and uh, very little visitor traffic. Business traveled down. Um, substantially. So hotels, restaurants, uh, those sorts of things suffering. Um, but as is often the case, Rupert is counter cycle on just all the time. And so our core industries are smoking. Um, uh, you know, uh, the container terminal is absolutely plugged. It's operating at about, about 125% capacity, I think. I went by it the other day and they're just tripping over containers. Uh, they've, they are actively in expansion plans. Um, uh, we've got a uh, one propane export facility built and operating. We've got another one being built and uh, that uh, proponent is has actually already started the environmental permitting for an expansion of the terminal that's not even yet complete. Um, so yeah, it, we're it, on our, our big challenge in the community, in fact, is housing and, and labor. Uh, mm. um, rents are sky high. Uh, we, we haven't done any uh, new subdivisions for years, decades. And uh, people are arriving in town and finding there's, there's just no place to live. So, um, so that, that, I mean, we're blessed that way, but, uh, but COVID's hit. And, uh, and of course, our um, indigenous community, uh, and both in Rupert and surrounding, are particularly uh, concerned. Uh, they tend to have a higher comorbidity, uh, um, you know, uh, issues. And, uh, and everybody remembers well what smallpox did on this north coast to, uh, to indigenous communities, uh, you know, a century plus ago, and and the graveyards are still filled with those markers. So, so COVID COVID's real, and it's it. Uh, we've had no cases, uh, and and I track this every day and cheer you guys on, Alaska. You continue to be the lowest state in the union, uh, which is fabulous. So whatever you're doing, you're doing it well. Uh, I. I really regret some of the stumbles that we have in places like Hyder and, uh, and Hyder Stewart and, and those issues. I, I wish people could resolve those with some just common sense solutions. But anyway, that's, that's life on the North Coast right now. And we had an awful summer. Is, um, is BC Ferry still active on schedule there uh, within their network? Uh, so yeah, so BC Ferries just stayed with their winter schedule. So normally they bring on the larger vessel for the summer and, uh, and it does an every second day round, you know, round trip to uh, down to Vancouver Island one day back up the next and, and frees up the smaller vessel to just continuously do round trips to Haida Gwaii. That's the normal summer schedule. They did not do that this year. So they left the smaller vessel uh, servicing both Haida Gwaii and uh, 
and, and Vancouver Island, but there wasn't a lot of traffic. Uh, people in Haida Gwaii are pretty much uh, staying under lockdown, more or less. Haida Gwaii did, I don't know if you, if it made news in your area, Haida Gwaii did have an outbreak. There was about eight cases, uh, I think, eight, no, 11 cases on Haida Gwaii. And uh, so that caused a lot of panic. I don't know if the other board members know, uh, except for Lacey, of course, because it was her project, but um, we have south part of Southeast now connected to Prince Rupert via telecommunication fiber optic cable that uh, KPU installed. So I, to me, that, that I think that um, opens up some possibilities uh, in a number of ways uh, for years to come, and hopefully we can build on that as a region and get that, that those commerce ties strengthened and, and widened. So that's still our goal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's critical, right? Can't do this without that. Exactly, exactly. And Zach, just so that you know, I don't see Caitlin on, but we'll be sending out some paperwork for you to, to sign uh, in blood and um, uh, look, look forward to your, your participation uh, going forward. So we, we usually would do that right after the annual meeting. We'd gather for a few minutes to to just go over some some basic stuff and sign up some paperwork and insurance uh, disclosures or whatever. So in case you decide something uh, in error or omissions, then uh, we got you covered. That sounds great. Robert, I'm looking forward to how many ties you receive. <laughs> <laughs> I, sh I should take you on a tour of my closet. It's <laughs> I actually started to feel I started to feel real anxiety for Senator Keel and how much he might be on the hook for. <laughs> I, I I have hundreds I could say. <laughs> so um, where's Rory at? So I thought uh, you know he, he he came barging into the the board meeting. There he is, uh, you know, wearing certain attire. And then where are you at now? You look like a half finished uh, man cave. Robert, Robert, I'm working on my sauna project. <laughs> Check that out. Yeah, we're uh, out here at Shelter Island. Oh, wow. So um, the, the, the question, Rory, was where's the next board retreat? Uh, <laughs> in my sauna at Shelter Island. <laughs> and Zach has con uh, has the transportation covered, so uh, I guess anything's doable. Nice. I think I uh, think I'm going to have to uh, go. Um, I just wanted to express an appreciation for everybody for um, you know uh, and. Uh, and I look forward to working with you all this year and and seeing anybody that wants to participate in the uh, maritime seafood meeting. Uh, we should probably and mariculture uh, meeting next week. So thanks right. everybody. Don't forget to uh, uh, don't forget to work uh, go go to the silent auction. I see the link is uh, is still active. So please go go bid on the items. Particularly the items that include kelp. <laughs> <laughs> Shameless plug. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to leave you too. I, I tell my wife every morning I'm off to Alaska and then I come through the door exhausted when I come home and say, hey, I'm headed back from Alaska. So uh, I'm going to leave you, Alaska. It's been good spending some time with you and uh, we'll see you in Haynes. There Great to see you, Herb. And for the couple of new board members, uh, Herb is actually a lifetime member. Uh, for his meritorious service that uh, he gave for over many, many years uh, to the conference. And he's just been a great partner in economic development uh, and just uh, all around uh, fun too, even on the it's, hockey uh, rink. It, it's one of my great prides. Uh, I, I brag about it often. I think I'm the only Canadian Lifetime member ever. And I particularly uh, am thankful that it was JC that uh, put my name forward. So lot, lots of really good memories. Indeed. You're here. All right. Ciao, everybody. Robert. Thank you, everybody. Right. Before people sign off, I just wanted to congratulate my cousin for making it on the board. <laughs> Zach and I have a, a relative, and so we call each other cousins. <laughs> I would not have put those dots together. Good right? to know. <laughs>
<laughs> but I start to see the family resemblance now. I mean, it's <laughs> all right. All, all one big happy family. That's why I love Southeast Conference. That's right. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Okay. Bye. See you later. Bye. See you. Bye. 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 All right. Anything else, anybody? Um, I'm, I'm probably going to uh, take a look at my <laughs> email inbox. Maybe. Maybe not. Yes. Yeah, still under 100. We're good. All right. Thanks, everybody. It was a great conference. All right. Have a good weekend. Bye. See you all again soon. Hey, Robert, real fast. What, is there another public um, um, meeting for the steering committee or is that now said and done? Oh, no, no. There, there's um, there's going to be meetings at least Wednesday and Thursday of this week. Uh, the Admiral had said possibly a Tuesday meeting someplace. So, um, but that's not been publicly noticed. So I don't think we'll have one this week, but the following week we could have two or three more. We're, um, yeah, we're, we're not anywhere near where I would say close to recommendations. Um, but he's doing a lot of writing on the side. So uh, there'll be some good material this next meeting to get eyes on, but, you know, trying to find that balance of systemic change, but doable change. Is the way that this goes down that um, the committee puts recommendations on the table and then you guys all vote before they go forward or Admiral Barrett just writes them out or how, do, how does that work? Well, <laughs> we're, we're looking for consensus, but I think at the end of the day, there's going to be a provision for, you know, a dissenting viewpoint. Yeah. So if there's um, a general sense of support for, um, you know, from the majority on, on certain points that does not reflect, uh, which is very likely for, for some uh, on both extremes of, um, of, of how you would deal with the marine highway system that they would have opportunity to write that into the report. Well, you're a busy guy. Thanks for all the work. Hey, um, I certainly do enjoy it. And, um, you know, the, the membership uh, just kind of, you know, kind of helps make it worthwhile because the way everyone rallies together and it's, it truly is a team, but um, I enjoy it and uh, look forward to working with you. Yeah, thanks so much. We'll yeah. talk to you later. Welcome aboard. Thanks.